Chapter 91. Kill Him. Amara sat nervously on the stands around the arena. Her parents and sister were to her side, as well as the chief and several other high-level spectators. Hundreds had already gathered from out of nowhere. Most of them were students of the Martial League. Tinder I was one such student. She wasn't worried about the amount of attention directed at John. The magisterium and his anomalous performance had already run him through that gauntlet. She was worried more about whether John could avoid killing Tinderai. She knew how his weapons worked better than anyone. It was incredibly difficult to rein in their power. All that was setting aside the fact he was drunk. She watched as he took another swig from a bottle of alcohol. She wasn't sure where he got it from. Maybe he pulled it out of his ass. A drunken man with those weapons was a recipe for disaster. She hoped Tinderai was stronger than he looked, for his own sake. It would be problematic if he killed someone of the Raven family, after all. Allow me to establish the stakes of this duel. Tinderai's voice echoed through the stands. If you lose, you will stop pursuing Lady Omara. Huh? Guy, I really hope you don't actually want to make those the stakes. Why? Are you afraid of your own weakness? A summoner isn't worthy of her hand, so you should face that reality now. Son, you have no idea what you're talking about. I'm saying, if you make those the stakes, I'm going to have to kill you. So don't, for your own sake. Shotgun in hand, John racked the slide and flung a shell skyward, nabbing it out of the air and turning it over a few times. This is a slug, right? Hey, do you have armor on? I do not. Tinder I responded, unsure of what to make of John's antics. John looked between him and the shell a few times, making Amara's anxiety spike. She shouted, No slugs. Fine. He shrugged and tossed the shell, littering the rest over the arena floor before slotting in buckshot. She sighed in relief, sitting back and earning her mother's curiosity. What are slugs? It's a type of projectile as gun shoots. They're meant for punching through tough armor, so if he uses them while Tinderite doesn't have armor, he'll kill him. He was serious about that? Looks of surprise spread on the faces of those nearby who overheard. Amara massaged her temples. Please stop underestimating him. His summons are wholly devoted to killing, and he regularly fights above his authority. Now he's been challenged to a duel by a knight while half drunk. If Tinderai really threatens his life, then John will kill him. Hmm. Well, at least you know he'll kill for you. How romantic. Fee nudged Amara with a teasing face, causing her to blush a bit while pushing back. Amara. A voice interrupted their play fight. Amara turned and found Shadowbane walking over. She waved. Hi, Shadow. So someone is trying to unseat your man, HM? What happens if he loses? He won't. If he does, it would be on purpose. That seems like a convenient excuse. It's a good thing I trust you. Shadowbane sat down in front of Amara, resting her back on Amara's legs. Let's just watch. I'll step in if you want me to. Thank you. Amara smiled at her friend's courtesy. By now, John and Tinderai finished their preparations. Almost 300 people had gathered in the stands, and more were still streaming in. Amara looked around and suddenly understood why this was getting so popular. It wasn't every day that a summoner appeared in their city, let alone one that could fight. They were all curious. Not only that, but Tinderai was somewhat famous himself. There were rankings for each of the years at the Martial League, much like in the Magisterium Elites, and Tinderai was regularly on top. He was also a direct descendant of the chief, giving him the same familial status as Shadowbane. He had both a name and the power to back it up. It was the reason he was one of Amara's suitors. If he married her, it would strengthen the alliance between the families. And Amara wasn't particularly opposed to his character by principle. It was precisely because of the alliance between their families that he actually treated her very well. While he may be a bit impassioned as evidenced by his eagerness to duel John, he was still a good person. It was just unfortunate for him that the two never saw much of each other given their geographical separation. Regardless, there were several good reasons to watch this fight, and people didn't want to miss it. Amara watched as John pulled out a pistol, holding the trench gun in his spare hand. All right, I'm ready. As am I. The two finished their preparations, and the chief raised his arm. Fighters ready. Fight. John had taken a rather strange stance just before the match started. He wielded a pair of rather strange rods, one short, one long, that looked much like batons. Tinderai was sure this would be a rather easy victory, despite all the grandstanding John had done before. His stance was so utterly unconventional it couldn't even be called amateurish in the realm of baton fighting. One small thing worried him, though. John looked a lot more resolute and self-assured in this strange stance than a rank amateur would. However, he cast those worries aside 
focusing on the upcoming fight and preparing to end it in a single slash. But he was very soon dissuaded from the idea this would be a quick and easy battle. A loud noise rang out the moment the chief dropped his arm, startling both the audience and Tinderai. He didn't allow himself to be distracted by such a trick, however, and remained observant of John's approach until a burning heat crawled up his gut. Tinderai glanced down. His shirt was speckled with blood, a hole about the size of his finger staring back at him. Ack, that hurt. He grunted right as the shock dissipated, paint shooting Scross's tough skin. He lifted his shirt, seeing as John only fired once. And he saw a huge welt on his abs, more specks of blood coming out as the flattened bullet fell off. It was not more than a flesh wound, but it took merely an instant. Not only that, the weapon it came from was much smaller than the other one in John's hand. Come on, bub. Let's see how far you can get. Tinderai leapt out of the way just as he heard the voice, throwing off the first of John's loud bangs. Two more landed before he had a chance to shift his momentum, but once he did, it threw off a few of the following shots. A momentary pause rang out and Tinderai thought John had run out of charges for whatever it was, but another bullet planted itself solidly in his gut again. The bullets had been filled with just a little psyche. Tinderai could feel remnants where the projectiles had hit him. He could, similarly, feel they weren't imbued with the most they could take. John was testing him. While he was processing this and preparing for a counterattack, a silence reigned across the arena. The audience was completely stupefied, the contrast between Tinderai's battered body and John's confident stance contrary to all expectations. John looked at his pistol for a second before tossing it aside, letting it vanish and raising his shotgun. And then, to the shock of all the spectators, he walked toward the night. Longer tube pointed straight at the smoldering Tinderai. Gritting his teeth, Tinderai considered his options. John was not only testing him, but so utterly confident in his abilities that he, a frail summoner, would approach someone perfectly capable of ending his miserable existence in a second. He lunged. Ack. Bang. An even louder explosion rang out. Tinderai staggered, nearly blown backward even with all his compressed momentum flinging him forward. Everyone watched with morbid shock as blood poured from the right side of his chest, shirt torn to tatters, holes dotting his skin. There wasn't much penetration, but it carried shocking pain. And John didn't stop. More explosions, accompanied by piercing pain, littered Tinderai's body. By the time the resounding noise subsided, his limbs and chest were covered in blood. But a knight was nothing if not resilient. Realizing that John's attacks were no more than superficial, he gnashed his teeth and charged through it. John had made one critical mistake. He let himself into a knight's range. With a burst in strength, Tinderai bound across the gap separating them, emerging from the grayish haze with sword in hand. John snapped to attention, his woozy demeanor gone. As soon as Tinderai landed, John let off his last shell, aiming right for his leg. Ah. Tinderai let out a scream, his shin blooming with blood and bits of flesh. He buckled for a moment but swiftly caught himself, using his other leg as a springboard to finish his attack. The last uncontrolled lunge from Tinderai sealed his fate. Too late to change direction, Madeir, he flew past John's dodge to the side. A thinner tube replaced the one in John's hand, a finger-sized hole blossoming through Tinderai's arm. Once he finished his roll and popped back up to his feet, John chambered another round and shot again, putting a hole in Tinderai's thigh. Ah! Tinderai yelled in indignation, continuing to try and charge John. He was faster, stronger, and more durable. But John was able to consistently put distance between them, finally taking advantage of his superior range, shooting while dodging and running. Tinderai couldn't get close without a new hole appearing on his body. And once he ran out of ammo for his Springfield, he switched to the pistol and loaded a fresh magazine, the fresh mag dump of empowered rounds more accurate and effective than his first probing attack. Tinderai felt his consciousness fade. Who? He let out a long breath when Tinderai finally collapsed heaving for breath while blood drenched his clothes and pooled on the floor underneath him. His eyes were sharp. Amara knew he had flipped a switch as soon as Tinderai had actually challenged him. Despite Tinderai being on the floor, though, John brought out the shotgun again and loaded it with shells, keeping a close eye on him. Stay down. I wouldn't want to blow off your leg. His voice was quite clear, no doubt aura enhanced, piercing through the low murmur from the stands. Amara, biting her thumb, suddenly heard her mother from the side. Well, I guess it makes sense. H.M.? What does? Well, he has more experience fighting people than scourge beasts. It's no wonder he handled that fight so well. I suppose. But all the knights here regularly fight each other too. That's true. 
It's also more than possible that nobody has any idea how to fight him. If you keep your distance, he'll shoot you. If you get close, he'll shoot you with another weapon. The only way to win is to catch him by surprise or survive long enough to kill him up close. Tinderai was incapable of either. Telexia had gotten a relatively good grasp on how John's fighting style worked. That's when Shadowbane stood and stepped down the stands, confusing Amara. All right, fight's over. John's the winner. She announced as she jumped and landed in the arena, walking over to John. However, when her voice reverberated in the ears of the fallen, it caused bubbling rage. Let alone when he heard all the murmurs of surprise from the stands. A knight? Losing to a summoner? It was incomprehensible. What knight could be so weak as to fall before the most useless magus in the world? The pain he felt told him that his loss wasn't unjustified. He couldn't so much as flex his thigh, let alone walk properly. The bits of metal still sitting inside his flesh reminded him, with a constant searing pain, that his life was no longer in his hands. But Tinderai's indignation wouldn't allow him to stop. He raised his head, eyes full of spirit, and reached out with his hand. How could a summoner resist his grasp? He would fall with a mere flex of the fingers. His hand brushed by John's leg, intending to grab it, though hardly having the time to. Complex purple lines on John's coat flared to life, his aura surging out with panic and unbridled killing intent. His head and shotgun snapped downward in unison, finger on the trigger and already squeezing. He was going to end Tinderai's life. He was practically screaming it to the world. Don't do it. The chief yelled, realizing what was happening, his body flickering faster than anyone could follow. Shadowbane was only slightly slower, her body flying so fast across the ground that dust kicked up in a thin line behind her. Boom. Everything happened all at once, everyone holding their breaths as the shot was fired directly at Tinderai's face. But luckily for him, John's body was ordinary. Even with the powers of his coat and mind, his body couldn't completely keep up with his thoughts, much less the chief's invigorated body. The chief's hand rested in front of Tinderai's face, buckshot pellets flattened across his palm and Shadowbane's sword was skewered through Tinderai's wrist, pushing it away from John's leg. The four were interlocked for a moment before John caught himself, muttering with a scoff. Fuck. Way to kill my bus. Sorry for making you move, chief. No need to apologize. One of our students didn't know when he was in over his head. I don't blame you for reacting the way you did. Even half-drunk, you've got better instincts than most. Thank you, chief. His face was filled with a goofy grin, conveniently explained away by the remnants of alcohol in his bloodstream. However, Amara sensed there was something more behind it than just inebriation. Shadowbane turned to address John. My turn now. Let's do it later, though. I'm down. Just let me know when. M.M. She nodded, pulling her sword out of Tinderai's arm and causing him to yelp. After that, some healers came and took him away. The chief looked around as chatter rose in the stands again. I announced the result of this duel as John Cooper's complete victory. A talented cold summoner has appeared within the magisterium. May his future be prosperous, and may the scourge quake at the sound of his weapon. Invictus! Invictus! Everyone cheered with the chief, John looking around in confusion. After that, everyone cleared the arena, retreating to the dining hall for the initial celebration. After the fight, Amara took away my bottle of alcohol and stuffed a cigar in my mouth. I was being forced to sober up. Thankfully, there was nobody else who wanted to duel me. If anything, I became a bit respected. There were many students from the Martial League who came to converse with me, wondering how a cold summoner, the weakest type of magus, was able to defeat a knight like Tinderai. With some explanations about my weapons, they were able to understand a bit more. Besides, they had all seen it in action. Some had even retrieved some of the pellets and bullets as souvenirs, passing them around. However, shock was further amplified when they learned I was still an authority for an entire level below Tinderai. Most weren't sure what to say, while many doubted my words. I didn't bother trying to convince them, though. I could only shrug and let them believe whatever they wanted to. After an hour or so the time for conversation passed, and I was allowed some reprieve. A big feast was also prepared during that time, so everyone took their place at a grand table seating over 100. That wasn't to mention the side tables holding everyone else surrounding it. Just the waiters numbered five dozen, all of them rushing around to cater to their guests. Platters of meat slabs were constantly replaced as they were devoured. Wine flowed like a river, the volume consumed placing everyone solidly into alcoholic territory. I didn't partake, but it was still fun to watch. A large chunk of the night was spent eating and drinking. It was toward the end when the chief suddenly spoke up with a small announcement. Duchess and Duke Teleria. 
I have some gifts I'd like you to accept. But first, I can't help but mention something I overheard. Mr. Cooper, I heard that you wanted a loot. Hmm. I looked up, caught off guard by the mention of my name. Looking around, I just nodded, making the chief smile. The six-string loot you had been eyeing during the theater performance was a bassin, and while we don't have a bassin specifically, we have one rather similar. For your victory during the duel, I'd like to reward you with one. I dash. Accepted. Don't deny his generosity. I heard Amara hastily command within my mind, preventing me from denying the gift, as I had just been about to do. As I was silent, a butler brought out the instrument. It was carried in what was essentially a guitar case, and when he presented it, I saw the instrument within. It was very similar to a guitar, with six strings and a body that could be comfortably held within one's arms. So while the shape wasn't the same, a bit slimmer than a normal acoustic, it still looked to have the same function with the sound whole and frets. However, it was incredibly nice. The wood was an odd deep blue bordering on black, and the strings were made of slightly golden metal. There were also some enchantments across its back. The craftsmanship was extraordinary. I couldn't help but reach out, too excited to use it. I grabbed it out of the health case, taking it in my arms and plucking a few strings, letting their somewhat unfamiliar notes play across my ears. Thrum. After a bit of tuning, I ran my thumb across all six, hearing the familiar blissful sound, smiling contentedly. It's amazing. Thank you, Chief. I'm glad it meets your standard. Now, allow me to present the Teleria family with their gifts. With his word, more butlers appeared with items in hand. I looked up, interested to see what they would get. Chapter 92, Revelation. The first to receive a gift was Amara. A butler came up and presented a small box, a ring sitting inside. It was a plain silver band with a stripe of white crystal going around its center. That ring stores charges of the blink spell, capable of instantly transporting you 20 feet in any direction at will. There are three charges and one charge is naturally accumulated every 12 hours. Use it wisely and it'll save your life in disadvantageous situations. Thank you very much, Chief. I will use it so. She smiled and slipped the ring on, prompting the next gift. This time, one long box was presented to Faye. She opened it with barely restrained excitement and found a sword inside. A long sword crafted by our family's best whitesmith with a concealed authority nine crystal in the base of the blade. Your father wanted us to make you a sword that would last you through your years as a knight. For potentially the rest of your life, this may be your personal weapon. As you grow, it will as well. It stows into a ring. Use it well. Ooh. Faye's eyes sparkled as she stroked the longsword. It was a mastercraft with a long silver blade and a black and gold hilt. The several enchantment runes along the flat of the blade were the only implication of the embedded white crystal. This was a massive gift for a future knight like Faye. She was so enamored with it, running her hands repeatedly along the flat and hilt of the blade, that Duchess Telexia had to remind her to give thanks. Thank you, Chief. Haha, <laughs> of course. Now, I open the floor to all those who wish to make their exchanges. Please, take the rest of this evening to enjoy yourselves and your gifts. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Everyone cheered before moving to socialize. Hundreds of gifts were exchanged between friends and family all around us. Amara. At that time, Amara and I turned to find Shadowbane approaching us. In her hands was a medium-length wooden box. Here. She held it out, letting Amara take it and open the lid. Sitting on the fine felt was a subtle dagger, its surface covered in so many runes very little of the original sheen remained. An undeniably deadly weapon. You'll be facing some dangerous enemies through the rest of your year, and especially when you enter the military. I won't be able to see you, so I want you to have this now. It was just recently finished. Oh my. Thank you. Amara held up the dagger, the intricately crafted hilt and dangerously sharp blade catching flashes of light. It's not meant to be used for anything except for a last resort defensive measure. It's a bonding weapon, and it has various magical functions capable of killing up to an Authority 9 beast. But only once. If its power is used, it needs to be replenished by someone like your mother. Its crystal can only sustain the more basic functions, not the high-end killing power. So like the ring, use it wisely. Well, my eyes widened along with Amaris. Being able to kill an Authority 9 beast was no small matter. For someone like us, that was some serious firepower to be wielding, even if only once. Not to mention how the killing charge could be replenished. That alone made it several times more valuable than if it were only consumable. Amara looked up at her friend with a gentle smile. Thank you again, Shadowbane. 
Unfortunately, my gift to you is still being made. I'll be able to deliver it to you not long after Christmas. Sorry. Don't worry about it. You know, I don't expect gifts from you. Sometimes I'm not sure if you're complimenting me or insulting me. Amara muttered, thinking, you could learn how to reword things, no? With a smirk, Shadowbane turned to me and nodded. Shall we go? Oh, right? Sure. Wait, what's going on? Amara asked, confused as to how we were talking as if we already knew each other. I shrugged. Shadowbane wants me to spar with her. I told her I'd help her out. Oh, can I watch? Fine with me. Sure. Both of us nodded, prompting Amara to follow as we left the dining room. From there we entered the empty arena, disregarding the blood splattered across the floor. You saw my duel with Tinderai, so you should have an idea as to how fast my bullets are. Those projectiles? Yes, I do. Though they weren't as fast as I expected. I've seen bows that can shoot arrows not much slower. Well, I've never seen a bow like that. It's no matter. It's still faster than anything I've ever gone up against. This will be a valuable experience. She walked until she stood 20 yards away, squaring off with me. I let out a breath of smoke, adjusting the cigar in my mouth before pulling out a loaded Springfield. I casually pointed my barrel at her, throwing out some preemptive advice. These things only shoot straight. No twists or turns. So try to predict the path of the shot based on my aim. All right. She nodded and drew her sword. It was slightly curved, a bit over two feet long, and probably meant to complement her high-speed fighting style. She took her stance, her eyes sharpening. It wasn't like I was trying to hurt her, so I steadied my gun and aimed at her leg, firing only after I knew she understood where I was shooting. I saw the bullet kick up a plume of dust behind her. It had sailed right past her thigh, attesting to her incredible agility. Her movement, despite having anticipated the shot, was still unbelievably fast. It was uncanny seeing a human moving with such speed. She kicked off, approaching me from an oblique angle. I shifted my aim to compensate, adjusting for a few seconds so my bullet would hit her abdomen and pulled the trigger. This time, she was unable to dodge, the bullet hitting just off center. She was barely able to move in time, let alone dodge it completely. She clicked her tongue, pulling the flattened bullet off her steel abs. Since it wasn't empowered, it didn't deal any damage to her. TSK. That's difficult. Fast and small. I can barely catch a glimpse with my eye. The fact that you can at this range says enough about your speed. It's insane. There's something I want you to keep in mind though. Just on the off chance you have to dodge something as fast or even faster than these bullets. I explained while stowing the Springfield, bringing out two 1911s. Don't react to the sound. Sound travels at a certain speed. That speed is surpassed by my bullets. That means the bullets will hit you before you even hear the sound. Is that so? Yes. Keep that in mind for the future. Also, you have to take into account your own body and how fast it processes things like your sight and hearing. You're talking about reaction speed? Something like that. When sound hits your ear, your ear sends the sound to the brain, and your brain has to make sense of the sound. That all takes time. It's only mere fractions of a second. But with speeds like this, that amount of time is crucial. This bullet will hit you not only before the sound reaches you, but before your brain could even process the sound itself once it hits your ears. You're saying that senses can be a weakness, and the best way to surpass that weakness would be to use something like Aura, which has none of those weaknesses. She looked at me with a glint in her eye, making me smile a bit. You catch on quick. Yes, Aura will tell you far more about the world around you, about the people around you and at far faster speeds than your body. It's an amazing thing every time I think about it. It's also the only reason I'm alive today. It was able to give me life-saving information when I needed it most. I can sense most threats before I see them, and react to attacks before they're even let off. I've gotten a glimpse of such things as well. But the complexities of Aura continue to confound me. It doesn't make sense when all the instructors and the Martial League explain it to me. All the techniques they teach to wield Aura feel worthless. Well, it's a good thing I don't have any techniques to teach you. All I have are my most important impressions about what Aura is. Take Amara, for example. Hmm. Amara perked up when I pointed at her. Her magic. She can cast spells in the air. How is that made possible? Her aura. She casts spells with her aura instead of her body. Exactly. Now knights. They can launch attacks with vigor beyond their body. That takes aura as well. They are basically doing the same thing as warlocks. That's true. So are you following the pattern? What is Aura in regard to those examples? Shadowbane stood still, staring off into space in thought. I waited for her, letting her figure it out. 
Eventually, she cocked her head. It's a way to extend vigor and mana beyond the body. You're halfway there. Rather than it being some random tool, what is aura itself? Well, that question can't be answered. Nobody knows what aura comes from. The best guess is the soul. Okay, you've missed my point. I'll just spell it out. I chuckled a bit and took out my cigar. Aura is an extension of the body. Not metaphorically, not figuratively, and not theoretically. You can treat it quite literally as the body itself. It acts no different from an arm or a leg. Now normally, vigor, mana, and psyche can only travel through the body. But if you use aura, extending the range of your body with another limb, you can use that magic beyond yourself. Shadowbane shivered in revelation, suddenly looking to her side and swinging her sword with all her might. Light bloomed across the entire length of the blade, a massive razor of light erupting along its path. It tore a trench into the ground before impacting the wall of the arena, shattering the surface, leaving cracks and one huge slash mark about twelve feet long. Ha ha. Amazing. She looked down at her blade, laughing in disbelief. It's so simple that I don't know how I was ever so stupid to not realize it. It's not about coating my blade with it. It's not even about those stupid techniques. Why don't they teach this? Why don't they tell us something so basic? Hell if I know. This is just what I've learned on my own. I've never actually been taught anything. That only makes you greater. Your talent is unlike anything I've ever seen. And although you've already done so much for me, I still have a question. Go for it. I tapped my cigar before putting it back in my mouth. You sense the chief's aura. How did you do that? Well, it's no different from how you launched that blade just now. Just instead of using your vigor, use your mind. It's easy to use my aura as an extension of my mind since I'm a summoner. But you should be able to do it all the same. Think of aura how you would your eyes or ears. Open its senses to the aura of others and take what you find into your mind. Others who don't actively control their aura will emanate their thoughts and feelings, or perhaps the power of their own aura if they have developed it. I see. Her eyes sparkled as she focused. I could feel her aura bloom, all of it focused on me. And it felt similar to what Amara would do when she reached out to me desiring a telepathic connection. I could sense her, her curiosity and excitement. I didn't reach out to her. I simply let her feel around. It would take more time for her to tune into her surroundings and the psyche of others like I had, but now she had at least opened the door. However, I did provide some stimulation. I suddenly raised my gun and fired straight at her chest. And without so much as a thought, her body twisted, the bullet soaring past fractions of an inch away from skin. Whoa. Even she was shocked by her maneuver. Her head snapped back toward me, a smile plastered across her face. I could sense it. I knew exactly when you were going to shoot. Bring your aura to a high enough level and it'll feel like precognition. I can predict the movements of knights and read their intentions to some extent. It helps a lot when fighting them. Not only that, but I can sense danger before it even comes. I don't have to see or hear an enemy. I can just use my aura. I can see that. It's a whole other world. I was blind compared to back then. You've opened up my eyes. Well, I'm glad I was able to help. Shadowbane stared at me intently for a short while before turning to Amara. Amara tilted her head at her friend. What? You lucked out with this one, sister. W, what do you mean? Amara turned flustered as I laughed. Ha uh ha. -huh. Yes, she did. Come here, darling. I ran over, bounding to her side and scooping her up before planting a juicy kiss on her mouth. She was too shocked to resist. After a moment of surprise, Shadowbane shook her head to the side. I didn't need to see that. Anyway, I'd like to prepare a gift for you, John. As thanks for helping me so much. I appreciate it, but I don't need a gift. I'm just glad I could help. You can't possibly not understand how valuable what you've done for me is. I have a feeling you do this often. He does. Amara shouted in agreement. He's got too much pride and can't accept help or generosity unless it's shoved down his throat. I had to force him to accept the guitar from the chief. You were going to reject that? He was. See, John. You're the stubborn punk here. Amara stabbed my chest with her finger in accusation causing me to shoot her a look with a raised brow. Keep talking like that, and I'll shove my tongue down your throat. Why, why, you bad guy? Shadow, help me. Do not bring me into this. Shadowbane dodged Amara's beat red, pleading face, quickly making her way out. And I gave chase just as the silly girl tried to fly away, barely managing to snatch her and pull her in for a loving embrace. Chapter 93 New Year Graceful strums of acoustic strings came together in a nostalgic memory. John humming an accompanying tune. Amara sat beside him on a love seat, leaning against him with her head on his shoulder, 
eyes closed as she let herself drift with the music. But she wasn't the only audience member. Beside the doorway, the Duchess stood silently, unknown to the two occupants. One was too focused on playing while the other was too enraptured by the music to pull herself out of her own little world. The Duchess couldn't blame her. At first, she had intended to enter and disturb them with some small business, but after hearing a few notes, she stood by and took in the music. It was calming, slightly somber, and well-crafted. Either John was a talented musician or he knew some songs and how to play them perfectly. She was inclined to believe the latter. It didn't detract an ounce from his talent. Not everyone could play an instrument at all, let alone that well. If you got the chance at all. Instruments were expensive, to say nothing of custom or high-quality ones. The one John received was especially so. The Wedded City was known for both its martial arts as well as the creative arts, be they music, painting, sculpting, smithing, or theater. There was no better place to acquire an instrument, and that dark blue lute was from the Raven family stash. The number of instruments on that level could be counted on two hands. It was assuredly very expensive. It had been given away since John had bested Tinderi in a fair duel, while half drunk. That was the official reason, anyway. Far more likely were the prohibitively exorbitant maintenance costs burning a guitar-sized hole in their treasury. Since the chief was going to give gifts to the Teleria daughters, why not also give one to John to both reward him for the duel and apologize for the disturbance? Well, that and the golden cigar case. The Duchess had seen it before and back, then it had given her a shock, as it had the chief. Every noble worth their salt knew about those things, and they weren't given to just anyone. The chief was probably trying to make an impression on John since he was also Amara's boyfriend. Regardless, he killed several birds with one stone, getting rid of an expensive paperweight in the process. And now, John had a loot. The Duchess was already enjoying his music, so she didn't feel like it was a bad gift. I was wondering where that sound was coming from. Ikor appeared in the hallway, walking over curiously. The music continued as he peeked in, seeing John and his daughter together as he played. The Duchess had already cast a mute spell, so the clicking of his tongue couldn't be heard by anyone but them. Tisk, look at those two. Our little girl is growing up. Eh? You seem to approve of them. And you don't? Look beyond the status and tell me exactly what's wrong with him. Well? She peeked through the cracked door, seeing him playing like there was nothing else in the world except for him and his girlfriend. Her eyes narrowed a bit. There isn't much, he's almost perfect. But like you had been concerned about before, I find his exceedingly high kill count concerning. And back then you had been the one to tell me that it wasn't anything to worry about. That it was all self-defense. Yes, but that doesn't mean such a thing is normal. You don't kill so many people and come out of it so innocent. Maybe I'm wrong, but I can't deny the possibility that he may have some psychopathic tendencies. So what would that mean for their relationship? Ikor asked, his curiosity piqued. The Duchess only shrugged. I'm not sure. I'm at least not worried about him. I'm worried about Amara. Yet another reason I wanted her to stay away from his business. She's barely been exposed to the harsh realities of war against the Scourge. She's only see a few people die to those monsters, a far easier reality to bear than seeing one man die at the hands of another. Or a hundred men dying at the hands of one. And then knowing that one is supposed to be your boyfriend. Yes. The kingdom has been without internal conflict for centuries. Most people believe that humans can only die at the hands of the Scourge because they are our sole visible enemy. Only within the dark sectors of the kingdom can one find the unseen realities. And John is deep within that darkness. The only question is, how difficult would it be to pull him out? That depends on him. For now he has the Magisterium to distract him. And he seems to be intent on joining the military. Where he goes from there, well, it's difficult to say. For now, we should focus on making sure nothing irreversible happens. The Duchess glanced back at John, staring at him for a few seconds before a pair of eyes suddenly flicked up to gaze into her own. He gave her a quick smile before going back to playing, causing her to sigh. Well, at least he's not untalented. How unfortunate that he couldn't simply be a noble. Or even a knight. Such amazing potential squandered on a common summoner. You say that, and yet he's proven that he's above average even among warlocks and knights. Summoners have a limit below warlocks and knights. All of them do. Even the greatest summoners to ever walk through history have never been able to surpass the Great Barrier. And the only one to ever come close wrought his own ruin before he could even try. The chances of John being any different are so low they aren't even worth mentioning. Ikor didn't respond, unable to refute. Those were simply the cold hard truths. He couldn't help but feel pity for John. 
For what he was, he was already extraordinary, but that didn't change reality, nor the biases others already had against summoners. All the cards were stacked against him. The noose around his neck only tightened day after day. At some point, he would be forced to face the coming storm head on, and he could only pray that he had prepared enough beforehand to at least survive it. However, what i hated most about the situation had nothing to do with John. It was merely the inability to completely extricate themselves from the influence of the noble class. Amara wasn't the only one beholden to their interests. Their power was the only reason she had a list of suitors at all, and was the only reason her marriage was a concern. Someone like Shadowbane had none of those issues despite being in an almost identical situation. The Raven family had enough independence to completely disregard the opinions of all the other nobles, even the Grand Duchies. The Telerias were more independent than most, but not to nearly the same degree. Ikor hated that, and he knew his wife did too. But they couldn't do anything about it. Not yet. Anyway, rash decisions couldn't be made right now, and certainly not for the uncertain variable named John. But the glimpse of freedom it gave them was one of the reasons he was taking a liking to John. Disregarding everything else about him, it was the slap in the face his mere presence gave the other nobles that he adored. At the very least, he didn't feel so bad about prolonging the time he was able to do so. Especially if it made his daughter happy. All right, let's let them have their time. I feel weird watching when he already knows we're here. Amara needs to prepare for the party tonight. She can do that later. In fact, you should be following her example and giving your big hubby some love. I'm feeling a bit romantic. Ikor moved in and wrapped his arm around his wife's waist, giving her tempting looks, like an alcoholic and a bottle of fine wine. Telexia glanced at her husband with a concealed grin, moving her mouth and whispering softly into his ear. Then, you should come find me in an hour. Once I'm done arranging the servants, I'll have a little time. But only if you're done with correspondence. Ho ho ho. You drive a hard bargain, my dear. But I'm nothing if not generous. Consider it a deal. He gave her a wide grin before planting a hand on her but with a loud smack. The corner of her lips lifted a bit as they parted. It was Christmas Eve, and the entire Teleria family arrived in the main estate for a grand celebration. On Earth, I had thought my family was pretty large. Several aunts and uncles, many more cousins, and some grand relatives. A few dozen was a good estimate. At the very least, houses were packed for holidays. But not like this. I looked around, seeing dozens walking every direction around the mansion and hearing even more entering through the front doors. It was already hectic and the first guest had only arrived around an hour ago. Amara wasn't even with me. She was taking care of some last-minute shopping, and it wasn't like I hadn't a thing to do, being an outsider. I could only grab a drink and observe from the side, trying my best to blend in with the sparse walls. I was adorned in my second-best suit, themed red for the Christmas occasion. This was actually something I had also convinced Amara to do. They didn't have the classic Christmas colors like on Earth, so I decided to bring them here and have her join me. Wherever she was, she'd also be in red. Everyone else was wearing normal suits. The Delaria family was composed of several branch families tied to the main one. This included the Duchess' two sisters and brother, along with their families, and some other detached cousins descended from previous family heads and their siblings. Regardless, there were a lot of people. Not too many children were around, mostly adults, including some young adults around my age, roamed the entrance hall. Because the family head, aka the Duchess, had inherited the great power of her parents, her siblings weren't as talented and thus didn't have as hard of a time having more children but that didn't mean they were having five or six. It simply meant they were more successful earlier, not many would be Amara's age, having breached 25 or even 30 years. This also meant the main line almost always aged slower, subsequent generations appearing at far greater intervals than their cousins. It was also why there were rules imposed upon the branches to effectively disown the ones that were too detached from the main line. Otherwise, there would be hundreds of branches by the time only a few heads had cycled through. That was another thing I noticed. There were two old people I sensed with some extreme power. They were subtle about their entrance, but I could guess who they were. Prior heads of the family. The ancestors. The position of family head wasn't passed down by generation. Those who reached that level of power were able to live for significantly longer and didn't need to be replaced so often. That wasn't to mention how it wasn't always guaranteed to find a suitable heir each generation. Quite often, a few generations passed before someone inherited the title. This also meant Amara wouldn't be the next head unless she showed power and talent just as great as her mother and was yet another reason why her marriage was a big deal. 
She was quite literally the perfect candidate as the daughter of the current head. Her fate had basically been sealed the moment Telexia rose to her position. Or, would have been, if not for me. Which was why other nobles were so pissed. I was screwing them out of far more benefits than I realized. Huh. Little poor me. I let out a hefty sigh, prying myself off the wall I was leaning against and heading upstairs. After a doorway or two, I found myself on a balcony overlooking the city. Christmas Eve was the most festive time of the year and every hour. People were counting down to midnight when the new year would start. It was already dark out, so I could see all the bright lights illuminating the streets between the city's buildings. The central palace in the city center was a mile or so away from the Teleria mansion, but because one of the central streets led from the front of the mansion directly to the palace, I could see the entirety of it with an unobstructed view. There were so many decorations hung over the street that it was a bit blinding. It certainly painted a spectacular picture, showing off the city's prosperity and joyous atmosphere. For a moment, though, I suddenly thought of the Tavares and how they must be doing. They had gone to war as soon as that auction was over, and I had no doubt that it continued on even into Christmas. It would only end when Patriarch Tavera completed a crown with the Authority Eleven Heart. Whoever used it would receive a massive boost in power and cement their position for decades, if not a century, to come. Back then, I had the fleeting thought that perhaps the Patriarch wasn't only Authority 9 as his bounty had claimed. After all, you couldn't use a crown that was too potent for you. If you were merely Authority 9 and tried to use a crown made from that Authority 11 heart, he might explode. So either he was far stronger than the public knew, or there was someone within the Mafia who the Patriarch was placing his hopes in. The Patriarch was getting old, so he wouldn't necessarily be the one to use the crown. Someone who would live for far longer would be the most optimal choice. Despite being relatively close to the man, I still knew next to nothing about their internal operations. They kept their cards close, so I'm sure I was in for a surprise when all of this concluded. As I thought of those things while gazing off into the distance, I suddenly sensed the Mara walking back into the mansion. We immediately found each other's gazes, even through the walls, our telepathic connection never having been disrupted even while she shopped and smiled. Our new range record had hit a mile. Amara had been shopping by the palace, about a mile away, and while the connection got a little foggy, we never experienced any disconnections. I imagined that a mile and a half was our furthest possible range. Quite useful in a world where radio didn't exist. Maybe I'd try to explain that to San and see if he could replicate the tech. She waved before disappearing into the house, so I turned around and started making my way over to her. When I found her, she was greeting all of the family that she knew. I let her be and watched from the side catching the occasional thought from within her mind. It was pretty clear which of the family she liked and didn't like. It was mostly cordial, with few being close to her and others not so much. I only made note of the adults she liked. Because none of the family needed to do things together like preparing the food, everyone was free to do whatever they wanted until the dinner or until some activities were started. Christmas in this world involved a few traditions, one of them being gift exchanges. I thought it was a bit unfortunate though. For me on earth, making dinner was one of the fun parts of Christmas. A dozen people crammed into a small kitchen, all scrambling to finish cooking in time or to keep something from lighting itself on fire, had a certain charm to it. Perhaps an argument here or there about whether it'd be better to add more milk or butter to some mashed potatoes or how much seasoning should go on the beef. That wasn't even to mention the simultaneous management of rambunctious children, yelling at them to take their activities outside and preventing them from climbing up on the roof in the process. Here, there were neither of those things. There were few children at all, and those who were there were properly behaved under parental pressure to look better in front of the Duchess. It was boring. Perhaps it was a bit friendlier since everyone was family, maybe a bit more comfortable, but it still felt like any other noble party. Amara slipped by my side. So, what do you think? Eh, it's quite tame. Well, obviously. It's not Batsy's Gala. I'm not comparing it to that. You know... I never thought I could miss screaming children and the smell of burning food. Burning food? The occasional mishap when cooking Christmas dinner. One time, my family cooked a huge pot of special sauce. It took an entire night to marinate about three gallons of the stuff. And then, when we went to go serve it, my uncle dropped the pot and spilled it all over the kitchen floor. Oh my god. Amara turned to me, her face horrified at the thought. I chuckled and shrugged. We barely managed to save a tenth of it, and it took two hours to clean. We ended up eating dinner much later that year. Sounds like a tiring Christmas. It was. 
Our house smelled like the sauce for a week after that too. But it's those kinds of memories that stick with you. Not how perfectly everyone is conducting themselves during what's supposed to be a fun holiday. I glanced around with those words, Amara following my gaze to look with me. Bright smiles, professional handshakes, the occasional chuckle and a bunch of business talk. The adults were networking, while the young adults were hiding in corners with the few friends they had made while they were younger. As for the five or so children I had spotted, they were following their parents, neutral expressions on their faces. I'm sure this was normal for all of them, but it had yet to feel like a holiday for me. I couldn't help but feel disappointed when comparing this with my memories from Earth. Or maybe I was feeling homesick. My family back on Earth should be celebrating Christmas right now, too. This was the first time I had ever missed it. It sucked. My mood rapidly fell, even though I had been telling myself to stay positive for Christmas. I guess Amara sensed it, too, because she was quick to come in close, looking up at me while taking my hand. What's wrong? Nothing. Just remembering. Yeah. I'm sorry you can't be with your family. If I could give you anything, it would be that. Thanks. But hey, it could be worse. At least I've got a pretty girl to keep me company. Hmm. Well, you're not so bad yourself. Omar smiled and leaned in coquettishly, wrapping an arm around my neck. Right when we were about to kiss, though, we heard a deep voice. John. Eep. Omar jumped when she recognized her father, quickly backing away from my face in embarrassment. Icor looked at us with a neutral expression for a bit before turning to me. If you two wish, the young ones are gathering in the atrium to swim. I opened it for them since it's better than walking around bored with their parents. Otherwise, the mansion is open to you. Please enjoy yourself. Understood. Thank you, sir. Midnight will be the final countdown. Everyone will be gathering on the balcony for that. He walked off with those words, leaving us to our devices. I smiled, thinking that maybe I was on Icor's good side. He seemed to be more lenient with us than the mother, which was the opposite of what I was used to. I could sense his goodwill when he told me to enjoy myself. And, perhaps a slight bit of pity, I turned to Amara and motioned with my head. To the pool? I suppose that would be more enjoyable. I haven't had a night swim in a while. Hand in hand, the two of us headed to our rooms to change before going to the atrium. We arrived to a slightly livelier recreation of the entrance hall. Most of the young adults and children had gathered here split into various small groups depending on how well they knew each other. It was, however, much friendlier than the scene we just left, familiarity and youthful energy combining to break down more than a few social conduct rules. That, where the parents just ditched them here, getting their alone time with each other without having to occupy the little ones. Amara and I didn't catch too much attention when we entered. I took a seat with my guitar case while some cousins walked up to her to talk. I was naturally introduced in the process. I stood and shook some hands, meeting some guys and girls around our age. Two of them were even magisterium students, and both knew me by name from the elite leaderboard. It was hard to tell what they thought of me. Here and now, they didn't express any animosity, but it was hard to tell what they really thought behind closed doors. They seemed neutral, however, probably because of the irrelevance of Amara's marriage to them and their distance from the elites. After some cursory greetings, we went to the side of the pool. She dipped a toe in. Oh. It's cold. Good. What are? Ah. She squeaked when I wrapped her in a bear hug, every gaze instantly snapping to us. Don't you dash? Ha ha. I let out a playful laugh as I sent both our bodies into the water, a wave surging from the point of impact. After a few seconds underneath, we both rose back up with deep gasps, brushing hair out of our faces. She splashed some water at me. That's the second time. Hey now, your hair looks just as good. Not the point. I like to acclimate to cold water. Where's the heat anyway? The butler just turned it on. Faye suddenly appeared in the water beside us, startling Amara a bit. I told them to. Oh, thank you. Hi, Faye. Hi, John. Faye and I smiled and waved at each other. That's when I had a spontaneous thought, grabbing Faye's arm and pulling her over to a side of the pool. Hey, you want to do something cool? Sure. All right. I'm going to sink under the water, and you're going to get behind me and put your feet on my shoulders. And then when I jump back up, you're going to jump off. Comprendo. Okay. Okay. I smiled as she went behind me, holding both her wrists as Amara watched inquisitively. Ready? M.M. All right. Taking a deep breath, I sunk down under the water, waiting there as Faye's feet found my shoulders, getting comfortable. Then, I bobbed up and down a couple times before launching her up with all my strength. She soared over the water, letting out a scream. Ah. I laughed as she went under 
taking a few seconds to come back up with a bright face. She brushed her ashy gray hair back with a smile. That was cool. Whoa. Some of the other kids nearby were mesmerized, like they had never seen anything like this before. I motioned toward one, who looked to be an eight-year-old boy. Do you want to try? Come on. Okay. He was a bit hesitant, but there was an underlying excitement as he swam over. I went under and let him get a foothold before launching him through the air. Huia. He resurfaced, clumsily smearing aside what hair coating his face. That was far. I want to try. A few more kids came over, encouraged by the bravery of one of their friends. I smiled and threw them forward, one by one. It wasn't particularly tiring, and there weren't too many. So I spent the next few minutes letting the kids take turns getting thrown across the pool. It was only when I got tired of doing the same thing over and over again that I finally stopped, taking a rest. I swam over to the side of the pool where Amara was lounging and watching, pulling up in front of her. I only rose to her chest when I stood. After sweeping my hair back, I reached my arm around her and felt up her spine, making her smile as she spread her legs a bit, allowing me to get in closer. She softly greeted me. Hey. Hey. You know, we haven't kissed today. I know. I've been busy. You have. But that actually works out, because I have an idea. Tell me, what do all the adults do at the end of the New Year's countdown? I'm not sure what you mean. There's nothing particularly special that happens, other than the fireworks. Then let me tell you about one of the traditions we have where I come from. My hand moved a bit lower. There was nobody behind her to see it, so I decided it couldn't hurt to get a bit bolder. At the end of the New Year countdown, everyone who's in a relationship is supposed to kiss. One kiss, right at the start of the new year. It's a sign of good luck. Or to some, it's a kind of promise that they make to the one they want to spend the year with. I see. Everyone does this. All the couples, yes. Millions of people across the nation, all kissing at once right when midnight comes. Apparently nobody does it here, but I wouldn't mind taking part in this tradition with you, if you'd like. Oh, of course. Hmm. That's good. Then, we'll need to make sure we don't kiss before then. I smiled before moving in and planting a kiss on her collar. I could feel the wave of chill she got on her arms. Why you just said no kissing? Not technically a kiss. I need your lips for that. Well, stop anyway. T, there's kids here. She whispered harshly, embarrassed by the gazes on us. I didn't even have to turn to know how many were looking. But it was fun teasing her, so I just laughed. Thankfully for her, it wasn't bright in the atrium. Only the moon, the stars, and the creepy floating plant things that cast light across the water, hiding her blush well. After that I jumped out of the water, grabbing my loot and gliding my fingers across the strings. Anyway, here's Wonderwall. Is everyone here? The Duchess asked softly while looking around. Small groups had gathered around chairs and couches set outside by the butlers, families and close relatives grouping together to celebrate the new year together. The atmosphere was quite joyous as midnight came. The children were excited to be up so late while the parents had loosened up with alcohol. And off in one corner was their own music, played by none other than John. He sat on one of the couches, painting quite the humorous picture. Faye was in his lap. The Duchess couldn't imagine how the two had gotten so close so fast. But neither she nor the four other girls squeezed onto the same couch as John posed any obstacle to his playing. They all carried looks of contentment on their faces, gazing at the moon or relaxing with closed eyes as they let the music fill their ears. And Amara, the one person she expected to be in his embrace, was in a chair to the side. It was like he had ditched her for these other girls. It was quite perplexing to Telexia, but she couldn't possibly think of anything to do about it. John's charisma seemed quite magnetic. At least it wasn't totally uncalled for. He had been playing with all of the kids for a couple hours. They all seemed to love him and his games. Even those just watching enjoyed his antics. It was no wonder they were drawn to him. That was before taking into account his music. He wasn't really a singer, but that didn't diminish his music. It was entertaining for everyone within earshot. Well, it would all be ending soon. Midnight was almost here and everyone would be leaving not long after that. Only a few minutes left. Telexia looked down at her aerial and mumbled. The city sprawled in front of them was fast climbing toward a climax. John was glancing at his aerial too. She could sense a slight tinge of anticipation from the little his aura gave away. She wondered what it was. Amara had also released a larger twitch of anticipation a few seconds after John, so she assumed the two were up to something. One minute. There was a shout, and everyone looked out toward the city. In the sky appeared a huge timer cast by a magic projection. It ticked down second by second, 
a dull roar from the city growing louder with it. Adults filled their drinks for the final toast of the year, while kids crowded to the front of the balcony to get a better view of the city beyond. John rose from his seat, placing aside his loot as everyone moved to the edge of the balcony for a closer look. Amara glanced over from behind everyone, seeing John arrive at her side. She muttered while learning against his chest, A new year. I can't imagine what it has in store. Neither can I. The last several months have felt like a decade to me. And a lot more is about to happen. Well, what better way to face it than together? How corny. I was trying to be romantic. She blushed a bit before glancing back at the timer. Everyone shouted as the final seconds ticked down. The entire city was chanting in unison. Amara glanced up, seeing John staring out with a neutral face, unable to guess what he could possibly be thinking about. I love you. She mumbled, causing him to look down with a small smile. I love you too. Three, two, one. Happy New Year. Fireworks were launched into the sky, filling it with color as the entire city roared at the top of its lungs. Off in a corner of the balcony, Amara lifted her head and grabbed Jin's suit, pulling him down, receiving a long, deep kiss. Her mind was filled with happiness. Her first kiss of the year with the one she wanted to spend the rest of the year, no, the rest of her life with. To her, it felt like this moment was the start of a new beginning. Up until she met John, her life had been normal. And then he came along and completely upended the place, citrine and rearranging until it was unrecognizable. It felt like she was a part of something bigger now. Her future now felt entirely uncertain. But she didn't give a damn so long as she was with him. If they had to take on the world, then so be it. No matter what, as soon as they went back to the capital, things would be different. She already felt like an entirely new person. This was just an expression of her change. And she had no regrets. She couldn't possibly imagine life anymore without him. In fact, she was almost scared of even thinking about what it would be like if he were to disappear. Just the thought made her emotional, her eyes tearing up a bit until they finally separated. They looked into each other's eyes, their ears filled with nothing but the explosions in the sky, their faces reflecting the colorful displays. John let out a long breath. How did I ever find someone as perfect as you? Amara froze speechlessly a tear falling out of the sheer intensity of emotions filling her mind. It was such a genuine question that its corniness couldn't even register. John's head tilted a bit, likely confused as to why she was crying. But there were so many love chemicals filling her brain that she wasn't able to speak, simply pressing her forehead against his chest and hugging him. He returned it while looking up, watching the fireworks and thinking of the future. Chapter 94 Facade Christmas passed merrily. The day was spent in the company of Amara's immediate family, as tradition dictated. It was a time of ease, comfort, and appreciation, so all families throughout the city spent their time together. There was nowhere to go, no parties to put on or attend, and only a few gifts to exchange. Since I got along with the family, I didn't feel out of place and contentedly enjoyed hanging out with them. I was enjoying myself when, in the evening, I received a succinct message from the puppet master that slightly dampened my mood. The Magisterium, specifically the President, has decided what to do regarding your kill. As for your request regarding the corpse, such matters are best spoken about in person. Come see me when you return. Until then, enjoy your Christmas. That was it, and the message left me with a small feeling of unease. I wasn't particularly concerned with what they did to my record or placement, but anything regarding President Carrion didn't sit well with me. Still, I had messaged the puppet master earlier when I had my thoughts about using the cyclops I as the ingredient for a crown. I didn't tell him the specifics, but let him know that I might have some business with it and asked him to hold it for me until I could grab it. This was the first message I received since then. If anything went sideways, it probably wouldn't have been his fault. I trusted him. I simply did as he said and enjoyed Christmas Day, the first day of the new year. It was the day after that I was set to return. Business didn't stop with the new year, and both the Duchess and Duke had matters to attend to. Amara was to stay behind and handle whatever her parents needed her to do. It was probably in the realm of organizing received gifts and bonding more with her flicker. There was just under a week left before the Magisterium's second semester would start. The elites were slotted to head back out to the front lines nearly immediately afterward. And so the day came for me to return. You promised you're going to visit? Faye, her voice tinged with hopefulness, asked. I smiled and gave her a hug. Of course. You just keep yourself out of trouble. Or just make sure you don't get caught. Ahem. The Duchess cleared her throat in warning, causing me to snicker. I winked at Faye and ruffled her hair, making her laugh. All right. 
I need to get going. Mr. and Mrs. Teleria, thank you for your hospitality. I quite enjoyed myself. Of course. Be safe on your way back. I will. I shook their hands before heading to the carriage, Amara following to bid each other a quiet goodbye. Once she closed the door, I was off to the rail terminal where I was sent back to the capital. Amara turned after shutting the door and watching the carriage roll off. She saw her parents staring at her, making her tilt her head. It felt like she was being put on the spot. What is it? You're quite the grown-up now, aren't you? I'm not sure what you mean. Amara was confused by her mother's scrutinizing comment, prompting her father to translate. Ahem, your mother and I happened to overhear yours and John's proclamations of love to each other on New Year's night. Eh? It was quite the surprise. We didn't want to say anything until he left, but we had never known you to be so bold. Icor chuckled a bit as Amara's face turned beet red. But instead of showing her embarrassment, she huffed and turned away. Oomph, I'm not ashamed of anything. It's the truth and nobody can say otherwise. We're not questioning that, dear. We just didn't think that you two had gotten so far. It's only been how many months? Almost four. And you two already look like you want to marry each other. The Duchess commented with sharp eyes, making Amara go silent, neither denying nor confirming. She sighed at that. Daughter, don't make this difficult for me. Not any more than it already is. It never had to be difficult in the first place. You think Shadowbane would have to deal with any of this? Whoosh. A small gust kicked up right as Amara said that, making her heart pound erratically for a moment as a thick sound barrier was created, blocking out all sight and sound beyond their group. Not even Faye was able to see or hear what the Duchess said next. Believe me, Amara. I'm trying. I know we aren't the Raven family. And I'm sorry any of this was ever a problem. But it is because we can't control our own interests and power without the approval of the rest of the nobles that this is an issue. And we cannot extricate ourselves from their influence anytime soon. So unless you mean to doom the entire Teleria line right now just because you don't want to keep your pants tied, I suggest you work with me until we can find a way that works for everyone. Amara was silent, her head dropping with indignation. She wasn't mad at her mother. It was her hatred for the noble class that was only increasing. Telexia could only sigh. I feel like if I don't continue to expose you to the harsh realities, you'll run off and do something that will make all of our conflicts explode. I know you can't see a way out, and I can't give one to you right now. But you need to trust that I'll find one eventually. I just hate feeling like I'm just a tool. Frustrated tears rolled down Amara's cheeks. She felt like she was going to explode, yet was constantly being crushed and confined with no way to fight back. Telexia walked forward and hugged her, stroking her hair. I know. Again. I'm sorry. I wish I could have spared you from that. I thought that I could do so by finding you someone suitable, a good man to marry since you would have to anyway. But I didn't expect for you to find yourself one, and for him to be so outstanding that he would piss off the entirety of high noble society and risk his life for his girl. Sometimes I think that you're the lucky one, not him. Hmm. Amara smiled just a bit the two separating and looking into each other's eyes. Regardless of all that, plans change, and we adapt. What I need from you is to play the game with me and bide your time. If you really want this, then you'll do that. I have a feeling John understands that as well. He's rash, blunt, and frighteningly casual with people he shouldn't be, but he's also smart. That's probably the only reason he's still alive. So for his sake and ours, can you restrain yourself and play along? Yes. Good. Thank you. Telexia nodded and dispelled the barrier, sound and sight returning. Faye was confused but followed as they all walked back into the mansion. That's when Amara muttered. Fake it till you make it. What? That's what John said. I suddenly feel like it's quite the accurate phrase. I agree. Be prepared to do so. There are a lot of people asking questions and pressuring us to answer them. For the next few days, we'll be under some intense scrutiny. Is that why you've sent John away? I thought we were going to face these things together. Well, that was before he almost killed a suitor for trying to dismantle your relationship. I've decided that it would be better if he wasn't put into that kind of position again. I fear he would overestimate his enemies and accidentally kill someone in the process. Hmm. Amara smiled, pride evident across her face. It seemed she finally had her mother on her side. Now, all she had to do was, as she said, play the game and bide her time. So long as that worked, she wouldn't step outside the lines. It eased her greatly to know she wouldn't be going against the Duchess. The most pertinent issue now was the Teleria family's over-reliance on noble society. It wouldn't be a problem had they just been another good little noble family, sequestered in their own fiefdom far from the capital. 
as they currently were, that was almost exactly where they stood, but Amara's current predicament certainly increased tensions. And, if Amara read into her mother's words correctly, there was soon to be a lot more conflict in their attempt to extricate themselves from noble society. Their bid for freedom would not pass without some extreme consequences, and that made Amara wonder what her mother could possibly have in store. She would need some extreme measures to compensate for this extreme circumstance. Whatever it was, she didn't know even half of it. Fear now joined caution in keeping her in line. If she weren't careful, she would be the spark that ignited a firestorm larger than even her family could handle. My first stop after arriving in the capital a day later was the hotel. There, I unpacked and situated myself before sending a few messages and leaving to take care of my most important order of business. I soon arrived at the Polaris headquarters, finding my way to Maxwell's study. He greeted me with an even gaze. Yes, good day to you too. I have questions. I may have answers. He looked down at his desk, papers covered in scribbles before him. I took a seat and asked, I don't know if you've heard, but I recently killed a Cyclops scout. Yes, I had been notified that you did something rather impressive. What of it? I was wondering about its viability as a crown. Would I be able to use it? And would it be beneficial for me? Hmm. He looked up at me and backed down in surprisingly deep thought. Considering the nature of your weapons and their reliance on your sight, it wouldn't be a bad decision. A scout has an advancement path almost entirely dedicated to observation. Authority 7 is when they finally attain some form of offensive capability, but even that only stems from an extreme level of observational ability that far surpasses even those well above its authority. It's one of the most extreme examples of a specialized scourge beast. So yes, if you wanted to, you could use its corpse to create a crown for yourself. You wouldn't attain the same observational abilities, but it would still increase your own several fold. Really? If you truly think it's a good pick, then I'll go through with it. I already want to. Each body has a limit as to the amount of crowns it can hold. And this crown would fill a slot well. It's quite the suitable pick considering your style. It would magnify a strength of yours. His evaluation was straightforward, and he didn't even know the future of what my summons held. Sight being a significant factor was an understatement. It was the foundation of ranged combat if nothing else not to mention all the other benefits that greater observational abilities provided. I was fully prepared to move forward with this if he signed off. And since he did, there was nothing more to say. All right then. I suppose I just need to retrieve the corpse. Yes. Bring it here. Let me inspect it. And then we can find an alchemist to discuss the process of turning it into a crown. It wasn't dismantled, correct? No, it wasn't. Not even for its crystal. I gave it to the puppet master for safekeeping. Very well. Go get it from him. Perhaps we can have the crown ready before you go back out for your next trip. Sweet. I got excited, standing and making my way out. I'll go talk to him. M.M. He just nodded as I strode out of the study. From there, I made my way straight to the magisterium. I had already messaged the puppet master, and he was just waiting there. So with a quick ride, I made it to the gates where I sought him out. I found him in the training grounds, specifically that little shed he was always in. He was waiting outside. You're here. Yes. Where's the corpse? Come inside first. We need to talk. He waved me in with a less than jovial mood, amplifying the ominous feeling I had felt back when he initially messaged me. We entered the shed where he took a seat, inviting me to do the same. Once seated, he sighed and sat straight. First, let me tell you about the decision made by the president regarding your record. Okay. It will be recognized. You are now the first Authority 4 to ever kill an Authority 7 in Magisterium history. This record will stand for centuries to come, enshrined in the Hall of Fame. Even if there are those younger than you who eventually do the same, your record as the first will forever stand. It's an honor granted to extremely few. I see. My eyes widened a bit. I didn't really think much of it, but this was still a big deal. My name would forever sit on display within the Magisterium. Future generations would know that it was I who set that record something never done before in recorded history. I felt some pride in it, but refocused as he continued. However, there will not be a ceremony, as there were for other records. The record will be quietly enshrined inside the hall, not to be celebrated or congratulated. Hmm, well, I don't care about that much. I expected something petty like that. That's good, but... He went quiet, giving me a sinking feeling. What is it? Forgive me, John. I didn't realize until you sent me that message. By then, it was already too late. It seems that they ripped the opportunity away before we even realized it was there. 
That's the difficulty of having smart enemies. Puppet Master, where's the corpse? I asked directly. It was almost obvious why I had asked about it in my message to him. I wanted to make a crown out of it. But if he could see that, why couldn't they? I just didn't think they would stoop to that level. It hadn't crossed my mind. My kill should be mine to do with as I pleased, especially one of such a magnitude. But more than that, I had entrusted it to the puppet master. If I had at least kept the head with me, even just as a trophy, I would have been able to do whatever I wanted regardless of what they said. But I didn't. The puppet master stared at my shoes, unable to quite meet my eyes. A look of almost defeat crossed his eyes for a split second before he continued. Currently, it is in the possession of the president. Where it could be precisely is a mystery. Regardless, it is set to be enshrined inside a case within the hall later in the week. The corpse will be there alongside your record as evidence and a trophy. I want it back. Carrion gave me a message to deliver, in case you said that. An excerpt from Magisterium Regulatory Policy. The puppet master handed me a folded sheet of paper, which I took and read. Article 3, Section 1. Hunted beasts and their corpses become property according to kingdom law. The property rights belong to the hunter by default, unless otherwise dictated by any employing entity the hunter may be affiliated with. Section 2. As the employing entity, the magisterium reserves all rights to beast or animal corpses hunted by any and all students and staff under its name and purview. This includes all pieces and parts of the corpse such as the black crystal, and all monetary gains from selling the corpse, processed or otherwise, are, by rights, considered magisterium revenue. Article 2. Section 1 of the Ignoble Hunter Rights Bill. Only beasts or animals at or above Authority 9 are allowed to be claimed by non-noble persons regardless of any affiliations and or contracts which may dictate otherwise. This includes all parts of the beast or animal, such as the black crystal. Section 2. If the property has been processed or dismantled before the ignoble hunter has claimed it, and the ignoble hunter and the employing or contracting entity cannot come to an agreement on distribution of property parts and pieces, the property must be sold and the employing or contracting entity is allowed to withhold coin equal to the processing costs, with a limit of 70% the selling price. I sat there in silence. For some time, I wasn't sure what to think. According to law, I had no rights to the corpse. The only way I would ever have the rights was if it were an authority nine at minimum. However, there was some fine text hidden within these laws. The ignoble hunter rights bill. Keywords. Ignoble hunter. Would a noble child have to give up their kill to the magisterium? No, they wouldn't. The bill was only for the ignobles. The commoners. The peasants. I could practically taste the mockery in the name of the bill. In fact, the very paper I held oozed contempt. The president, having studied my weapons, or at least having read the reports about them, knew that my sight was an important factor in their use. And it wasn't far-fetched to think that I may want the corpse for a crown. It was well-suited for me, after all. Regardless of my plans for it, he seized it. And his only explanation were some snippets of law. He was prepared for this. He knew I would come for the corpse. Even if I didn't, either he wasted a small bit of time printing this message, or he would taste the satisfaction of withholding an important opportunity for my growth. And he did. This could have been an incredible boost in my auxiliary power. The advantages in battle I would have gained from this crown would no doubt be a potentially critical factor in preserving my life and the lives of my team. And now, with a single piece of paper, all hope of that was lost. There was silence for a long while as I processed what this meant and how I should react. I truly wasn't sure. Should I rage against this? Should I just laugh and declare war? I set down the paper and stood from my seat, walking out of the shed without a word. My feet took me to the administrative offices of the magisterium. I pushed open a door smoothly, the only sounds in the main hall, the even tapping of my heels and the soft click of the door behind me. I walked past various doors, plaques by their frames denoting the positions of their occupants. Most sat empty. Two flights of stairs later, I walked down a lushly carpeted hall, my footsteps muffled by the thick fabric. The plaques on the wall all seemed to point me to one spot, President Carrion's office. The desk right in front was empty, the secretary that would have stopped me gone on vacation. I nearly threw the door open. Carrion stared back at me, a smile creeping onto his face. Oh, John. You've returned. A towering window silhouetted him against the magic tower in the distance, his outline practically glowing in what seemed a cruel mockery of my suppressed anger. I walked up casually enough, unknown strength keeping me from just leaping at him, and stood squarely before his desk with a placid face. I want the corpse of the Cyclops scout I killed. 
Given your mood, you visited the puppet master first, who should have given you my response. I don't believe there's much more to say, oh dash. Fuck the loss. I curse plainly, without a single change in attitude. You don't care about them. Your prideful ass thinks you're some kind of king. Skip the bullshit. One of your students wants the trophy of his kill. You'd think a reward is an order for the first record of its kind. I thought we were skipping the bullshit. Carrion shot back, rising from his seat and meeting me at eye level. His aura fanned out as he did, a sense of dread permeating my pores. But I felt so detached from my own self that I didn't even react to it. My emotions didn't feel like mine anymore. You're right. I don't give a damn about the loss. Except when they give me every right to tell you to fuck off. You're not getting that corpse. And you're not getting a crown out of it. He smiled and eyed me, a certain facet of his genial facade revealing a much darker interior. I'm going to lock that corpse away, crystal and all, right inside the Hall of Fame. I'm going to pin it up nice and pretty behind a single pane of unbreakable glass. Everyone will be able to see it and know you were the one who killed it. They'll sing your praises for the next few months. You'll become an idol for the younger generations. And yet, you'll always know that the corpse behind that glass could have bestowed you greater power. It will forever be a reminder of what could have been. So please, indulge in your hatred and rage. I want to see your frustration and indignation. It's the least you can do for attempting to undermine me in my own mansion. Even though something like this is a small matter I shouldn't mind, even though you're a bug not worth paying attention to, I've decided to do so as I was bored. What better way to entertain myself than to see a worm like you squirm around when he was denied the little scraps of food he caught? A harsh laugh came from his throat as he walked an arc in front of me. My vision turned spotty. My mind went white. I couldn't comprehend the sheer intensity of my emotions. This kind of depraved malice. I didn't understand it. My rationality screamed at me exactly what I needed to know. But even with the power of Psyche, it didn't get through. I didn't know how to react to it. Even my aura boiled over, slashing against carrions with wanton rage and an attempt to gain a foothold. But against the Authority Eleven, any cracks were as ephemeral as the light. I was powerless. That's just how it was in this world. I couldn't do a damn thing about it. Having had his fill of fun, Carrion sat back down behind his desk again, a frown filling his face. All right, now get out of my sight, you insect. Bam. He flicked his hand, a wave of vigor throwing my body across the office. I rolled limply when I hit the floor, only stopping when I crashed into the door. It felt like my entire body had been battered by a sledgehammer, blood leaking from my nose and mouth. With nothing more than a thought I suffered debilitating injuries. That was the physical manifestation of such a difference in power. I pulled myself off the floor with any scraps of energy left in my body, too exhausted to even offer one last sign of defiance by slamming the door. I needed to retreat and regroup. Sticking it out here would achieve nothing. Once I had stumbled my way out, I caught sight of the puppet master just outside the building, my head pounding from my thoroughly battered aura, my body throbbing from new injuries. It was a good thing he was there too. I didn't have the strength to walk myself back to the dorms. I crumpled into a heap on the pavement, a few quivers of pain racking through my body. The last thing I saw before darkness took my vision was the puppet master looming over me, mouth open with unheard words. Chapter 95 Hunt when I woke from my slumber, I was met with the cold white ceiling of a hospital room. After my vision cleared up a bit more, I sat up slowly and scanned the room, recognizing the magisterium's own medical ward. It took another minute for the throbbing in my head to settle down enough for me to process everything. The memories came racing back. My psyche overwhelmed just trying to categorize everything. Dreams served me well in formation advancement. They served better in helping me understand my memories. By the time I had made sense of everything, the situation had been laid out and analyzed in a far more objective manner than previously. I had gotten too caught up in the extreme circumstance and lost myself back then. Now I could look back at what happened with a clear head. And I didn't like it one bit. I had been denied a vital boost in power. I was to be mocked with my own trophy. Carrion shed his mask and toyed with me as a cat might a mouse. We were now assuredly mortal enemies. It was almost odd how that worked. I didn't think I could ever have a mortal enemy like that. But by now I was pretty sure both of us wanted each other dead. The only thing stopping either of us were our statuses and Carrion's own biases. I wasn't worth the trouble to kill. Not yet anyway. If nothing else, he made that fact clear. I suppose it was actually a good gauge. I at least knew that there wouldn't be any serious attempts on my life yet. My powerful detractors still thought I was just an annoying bug. And so I was denied my crown, but that meant nothing changed. 
I could keep moving forward as I had been. I tapped my aerial and made a call. Yes. Maxwell's enthusiastic voice sounded in my mind. Yeah. Hi. So funny story. I gave him a quick rundown of what happened, causing him to go silent for a few moments. Unfortunately, I can't do anything about this. I'm not what I once was. If anything, you got off lucky. The only thing holding Carrion back was fear for his reputation and complete arrogance. The situation could have gone much worse. You should be glad Carrion thought so little of you. I hummed at his succinct appraisal. So now it's just a costly lesson and a mistake you won't make again in the future. You've lost another layer of insurance, but at least you weren't making any significant bets on it. In the end, this changes nothing. I know. Back to training it is then. Indeed. There will be opportunities again in the future. And at least now you know the things nobles will do, even if only to be petty. You lost an opportunity for growth. He merely said a few words to those under him. The power nobles wield is far greater than your own, so, for your own sake, stop provoking them. I'll do my best. Pray that it's enough. He hung up with that response, making me click my tongue as I put my wrist down. I immediately lifted it back up and noticed the time, well into the next day. A few notifications from Amara popped up, all during my vacation from consciousness. My rampant aura back then really took its toll. My emotions had reached such an extreme that I almost completely detached from them, as odd as that sounded. And as a result, my aura had sharpened significantly. Perhaps in an attempt to express my rage, my aura had clawed against Carrion's. But it was completely stifled in its attempts. Carrion was simply too powerful. The best metaphor would be a scalpel trying to cut through a foot of solid steel armor. There simply wasn't anything I could do, no matter how much experience sharpened my blade. This was maybe also a good thing. Our fight, if you could even call it one, was one of aura. No physical traces other than my blood were left behind. Should Carrion claim I tried assaulting him, he would have to fabricate evidence in his support, and would still be laughed out of court at the mere idea of a student's seven authorities below him coming even close to hurting him. It had also served as a sort of tempering. That was the first time my aura had been so unrestrained and yet utterly confined. It was a valuable experience, using my ability in such an extreme way. At least I hadn't come out with nothing. I sighed while dialing Amara. Hey John. Hello, my sweet. How are you doing? I asked with a bright smile. It felt good to hear her voice. She sighed. It's fine. Boring, maybe a bit irritating, but fine. How about you? I tried to call you yesterday. Are you alright? Of course. I was just occupied for a while. Good. How about matters with the corpse? Is a crown viable? She asked expectantly. I had naturally told her about my plans when I thought of them. I just never expected things to go this way. But I didn't want her to worry. She was dealing with things on her end, so I wouldn't burden her with yet another issue until she was free. I'm not sure yet. The stuff regarding crowns is pretty complicated, and I'm still waiting to get news on what the Magisterium is doing. I'll know later when people start coming back from vacation. Alright. I'll try and finish things over here. I want to be back sometime within the next few days. That way we can have some quiet time to ourselves before things pick back up. Sounds lovely. I offered a pleasant agreement. We went on to talk for a while. There were no doctors to disturb me, so we had a nice conversation before hanging up for the night. I proceeded to leave the hospital, checking out with a clerk before going to the hotel. Hello, John. I was greeted by an ever-so-familiar face, him and his pristine white gloves that handed out the occasional key. Hey, key master. How's the night? It's been rather busy with the war going on in the market. Thankfully, the initial explosive confrontations are over, be it because tensions are lower or the warlocks are dead. Now all we have to deal with is the constant skirmishes throughout the city. I see. Do you think Tavera family's coming out ahead? Hard to say. They're being attacked from every possible angle, stretched as thin as they can be without breaking. But the fact that they haven't been defeated speaks volumes as to the power they've accumulated over the years. Seems so. I nodded in thought. The fact that the Tavera family could take on the combined forces of every other competitor in the market and force a stalemate meant they were well above any of their enemies individually. This was contrary to public belief that they were at most equal to the others, a balanced triad of mafias in the founder's market. Patriarch Tavera was well prepared, and that immortal heart was the trigger for all of this. These plans were no doubt months in the making, if not years. The Tavera family would either rise to heights never before seen, or be eradicated from the face of the market entirely. In such a war, there was little I could do myself. How long do you think this war will last? 
That depends on the Tavera family and how fast they can concoct the crown out of the heart. It could be anywhere from a month to half a year. They at least have the power to repel their enemies, but not forever. Right? Well, I'll be gone for most of it. Maybe when I come back from my next trip, it'll all be over. There's a chance. But this is also a time of opportunity for someone like you. If you would like to take a look. I was silent as the key master slid a small stack of papers over to me, a solemn look crossing my face in the process. He noticed, a placating smile supporting his next words. Don't worry. This is merely one of the bounties on the repository. I felt it would be a fine chance for you to make some extra money while ridding the market of yet another parasite. It'll be far easier than your last kill, because this person is a summoner, like you. H.M. That's rare. I took a breath while grabbing the paper, reading some details about a woman. She was the head of some company that specialized in smuggling operations. They moved not just people but hard drugs. Her company alone was responsible for nearly 30% of the entire market's drug throughput. The key master spoke as I read. Killing this woman won't stop the smuggling. It'll just stifle it for a short period of time. But what this will do is create a power vacuum that many unsavory individuals will be fighting to fill. The war with the Tavera family is already kicking up a storm. This will make it worse, and in the process, take a small amount of pressure off of them. That's not the reason I'm offering this to you, of course. But it is a natural consequence. Chaos will put a halt to any operation. It'll destabilize everything and present more opportunities to continue dismantling the structure. Exactly. But being a woman as rich as she is, she naturally has a significant amount of protection. She's been able to use her summoner smarts to avoid any and all calamities that would have befallen her. So it's obvious to say that she's cautious, perhaps paranoid. But I'm willing to bet nothing can prepare her for you. And given her completely ordinary body, I don't have to worry about sheer power. Any of my attacks can kill her. But she no doubt has protection against that, like armor or some magical stuff. I muttered, seeing the few pictures of her with various pieces of gear on. She really did look paranoid. She probably didn't do anything beyond the walls of her own home if she didn't have to, and when she did, she only went out with the best magical protective measures. How was I supposed to pierce that? It was safe to say that nothing I had could pierce defenses bought with money like hers. And the key master confirmed my guess. Indeed. She has a long list of protective items from the clothes she wears to some amulets. However, one thing has to be noted about the amulets. They are magical defensive systems that react to anything it can detect. But even the best of those aren't invulnerable. Do they react specifically to magic? Any magic that comes within a certain proximity of her is automatically defended against. And anything that would physically harm her is likewise defended against with a shield. But nothing is instantaneous. A projectile fast enough might be able to pierce the veil. I perked up an understanding, causing the key master to give me a small grin. Are you willing to take that bet? You must know the consequences of failure. You already have a rather massive target on your back. Exactly. The target is already there. They're gonna hate me anyway. May as well make them bleed for it. Besides, I recently got a whiff of a new toy to play with. I took the papers and started walking out of the hotel. Any details about her that I needed to know were on it. The key master waved. Enjoy your hunt, John. Always, key master. I didn't immediately go try and find my new target. I needed to study the information I was given and also take care of one piece of business. I hadn't been idle in my training while on vacation. I still cultivated my authority every night and scouted my dimension for interesting things. Most of the time it felt like I was sending a drone out into an empty void. But recently, I had picked up on a new lead. There were two guides that I used for searching the dimension. The first was my Psyche that I could use for brute forcing wide area searches using pulses of power. The second was a more recently discovered method, and that was using my aura to feel around for spirits. It was with my aura that I was able to point myself in the direction of a new spirit. It didn't feel like anything significantly more powerful. It carried a signature similar to the Springfield, but it felt different, which meant it was modified. I decided to check it out before moving forward. I had a feeling it would be useful. So I lounged in my hotel room for a while, sending out my psychodrone over to find the new gun. It took a while, but after going deeper into the endless darkness, I was able to find it. It was definitely a Springfield, but two new attachments were immediately familiar. First was the scope. Second was the barrel extension, one I recognized rather quickly. I didn't hesitate to go up to it and commune with it, and the first thing I received was an influx of memories. Major, what's this thingy? 
It's something made by Maxim, or whatever the company name is. It's called a silencer. Don't take it off or fuck with it. There's only 20 of these here, and I barely got the letter allowing me to access them. What does it do? I asked while lifting the rifle, examining the smooth barrel and strange cylinder on its tip. There were some ridges along the center portion of its body, but otherwise it merely looked like a long, skinny canister. It didn't look particularly special, but I had never seen anything like it. At the very least, the rifle already had a telescopic sight. They were definitely more useful than ladder sights for targets at a distance. At least in my own experience. The Major issued a few more out to my buddies before addressing us. It's a silencer, so it silences the gun. Reports show that it reduces sound at the muzzle by a third. It does nothing to prevent the crack down range, but it almost entirely eliminates muzzle flash, so I'm fitting you guys with them. We'll be doing plenty of night operations soon, and these will hopefully be of great help. Where does the bayonet go? Nowhere. These can't fit them with the silencer there. But we won't be fixing bayonets anytime soon, so get used to it. After passing out all 20 rifles fitted with scopes and silencers, the Major ordered us off. That night, we were back out in the field, flanking hostile operations establishing new trench lines under the cover of night. In the darkness, a muzzle flash easily exposed your position. Combined with the sound, it was almost impossible to keep your position hidden. But with these, it almost became easy. A bullet sang through the night, planting itself solidly into the forehead of a man barely visible in the dust and dying light. A few moments of silence reigned, then the camp burst into life. Alarms wailed for alerted ears and lanterns flashed to life in the darkness. Some of those lanterns were put out almost as quickly as they turned on. But one wasn't, and it revealed a few men inside a small pit a bit farther away. I shifted my sights onto a highlighted silhouette, the light a consequence of negligence or a futile attempt at gathering more information. The supersonic whiplash of the bullet sounded right after I fired, right as the man's figure crumpled out of sight. I had yet to be accurately located, but suppressive fire started plinking my way. I was still green. They hadn't a damn clue where I was. Besides, I wasn't the only one. Another shot rang out from my left, and the gunner slumped back before his loader even had another belt of ammo in his hands. A third shot left the MG nest filled with naught but bodies. My partner next to me snickered. Come on, keep going. Can't let them beat you. Keep your trap shut and find me a target. One o'clock. There's a runner. I fired again, cutting him off mid-stride. I let out a low whistle after that shot, impressed that I even hit a moving target that distance. A spotlight suddenly flared, briefly washing out my vision and turning night into day. I remained perfectly still, letting what may well be a beam of light with deathly powers itself illuminate my motionless body, not even twitching as a bug meandered across my arm. It swept past us and back. The thumping in my chest grew louder. The beam slowed down near me, almost touching my leg. A report rang out again in the night. The almost musical sound of shattering glass reached my ears, and, more importantly, the light at my feet vanished. Another shot. Another kill. Bullets continued to rain down on the outpost as enemies scrambled to find their killers. But they couldn't. There was no muzzle flash, only the cracking sounds of each bullet as it took another life. There were too many soldiers to possibly kill even a majority of them with our small fire team. The enemy had also started sending squads up the hill we were on to hunt us down. While we could sometimes cut them down, and distance was definitely our friend, there were so many other targets we needed to focus on. It didn't matter if they were picked off while ascending, they needed to find us. They couldn't have snipers pelting them all night. However, right as I decided it was time to leave, my spotter spoke. Hey, that's a general. He's got a gold bar. Where? In that car approaching from the northwest. I slung my sights in on the location, and sure enough, I found the general riding shotgun. There was a golden badge on his right shoulder, one with two golden bars stacked on top of each other. I didn't know what rank it specifically was, but it was a general, and that made him a high-value target. Knowing that, I disregarded everything else and took a deep breath. I could only see and feel. Everything else felt dulled to the point of non-existence. My entire world was the cold steel of the trigger on my finger, the wood on my cheek, in the rapidly changing figure of the general. The flag nearby had already been marked by my spotter as being just under 500 yards away. It was a long shot, and the car was moving, but I had hit longer. The car came to a momentary stop, and I found my opportunity. I had concerns about the driver blocking my shot as they turned at such an angle, but I didn't have time to worry about that. I took my shot right as I felt sure. 
Then I watched intently for a second until the bullet landed, tearing through the head of the driver and piercing through the general's neck just beyond it. One shot, two kills. Holy shit. Major ain't gonna believe that shit. The engine of the car revved, the Reaper taking control for a moment as it swerved to the side. My spotter laughed in disbelief before jumping up. Let's get the hell out of here. Yeah. I tore my eye away from the scope, running uphill and away from the chaotic enemy camp. Well, damn. My eyes opened, Springfield in hand before I realized it. I looked down and examined the new rifle. Optic mounted on top and the Maxim silencer on the end of the barrel. Not only had I attained this modified rifle, but now I had memories of someone taking an accurate shot at around 500 yards. The longest shot I had taken so far wasn't much farther than 300 yards. Any farther was Luck's territory. But that shot wasn't luck. That was cold, hard skill demonstrated by a sharpshooter. And now, I had those memories and experiences. I smiled and thought of the possibilities while rising from my bed. I had my target, and night was falling. It was time to hunt. Chapter 96, Complacent I perched atop a roof, the fifth story blending in well with similarly tall buildings nearby and giving me clear lines of sight to a large plaza filled with a red haze. Target, Sarah Trot. 47 years old. Summoner, Authority 8. She only made herself visible in two areas, the red light district and the founder's market, and another city outside the capital. The war had brought her back in town, the chaos providing enough opportunity to warrant her personal attention over the last few days. According to some eyewitness reports, probably the ones that confirmed her location to begin with, Years of living as a higher authority and under defensive measures made her a bit more complacent than during her initial rise to power. She was no longer as paranoid. Assassins and bounty hunters looking for her head either met grisly fates at the hands of her bodyguards or couldn't even scratch her countless layers of defense she always wore. All that concerned me was her recent resurgence in regular, predictable activity. Now would be as good a time as any to make a move. The plaza itself was around 300 yards away. It was nearly impossible to miss. A rather demonic red glow spilled through the surrounding streets and into the air, almost like a literal pit of fire and brimstone. That plaza was where Sarah had appeared six times in the past week. She always worked in the dark, so I just needed to stalk the place at night. However, picking her out among the crowds would be a difficult task. If I had the crown from the Cyclops Scout, identification would probably be pitifully easy. I let out a sigh. Remembering such an emotionally charged and unstable moment wouldn't help me with waiting. I adjusted a few crates in front of me and set my rifle upon them. The new scope was a welcome addition. I could now see a bunch of bare tits in riveting clarity even from so far away. But I didn't stare. I had a job to do and a girlfriend with even better tits. I could stare all I wanted when I finished, but the only thing I would be staring at now was heads. And so I sat there for three hours. It was incredibly boring. The only movement I made was switching eyes on occasion to reduce fatigue and pulling back a little to get a better view of things. That's when I spotted something, or someone, interesting. Rayla was strolling down one of the streets, occasionally throwing a glance to a particularly dark alleyway or suspicious building. I got curious and followed her with my reticle, watching as she entered one of the red buildings. She came out not long later, walking just as casually as she had been before. Probably a delivery. Those were fun. I smirked and reminisced. Before getting sent to the trenches, I had the pleasure of making some deliveries to the brothels. Out of the dozen or so deliveries I ever had to those establishments, seven resulted in the owner offering some services in exchange for payment. I never accepted, of course. Coin was more important for me at the moment. Even so, I wasn't about to risk getting some kind of magical disease from a whore. Did magical diseases exist? I would assume they'd be on a whole other level from regular diseases. Maybe they only infected people with magic. Still, I had never heard of them before. Or maybe they were just classified as poisons or parasites instead. I returned to my reticle and followed Rayla as she walked off, sliding gracefully out of a few drunks attempts to hit on her. I sighed once she disappeared from my line of sight, going back to watching. My spark was probably the most useful to me right now. With it, I could focus on the task at hand while also having my own thoughts. I could simply assign it to track and match faces to the picture of Sarah I had in my mind. The rest of my mind was generally free to wander, so I was able to keep myself occupied with some daydreaming. It was only unfortunate that I didn't have music. Playing music with my guitar right now would be stupid, and even if I had a way to play back the music of this world, it wasn't particularly to my taste. 
I had the faint hope that I would get some kind of device in one of my future authorities. At this point, I would welcome a gramophone, if only for the novelty. It wasn't only weapons that I found in he dimensions, after all. But there wasn't much in the way of radios in WW1, so my options were limited. And even then, my kind of music wasn't relevant then. I'd have to wait, as I needed to for countless other things. Another sigh escaped as I moved my reticle to check a doorway. There were a few doorways that Sarah came out of the few times she emerged. The one I focused on was one of them. It creaked open. Cautious eyes scanned the alleyway before the burly body it belonged to slid out, scouting the area and motioning behind him. My eyes narrowed as a woman creeped out, escorted by another four men. Bingo. I centered my reticle on her, calming myself and bringing my full mental capabilities to bear. Although she was dressed in a large coat that protected all her vitals and a hat that could no doubt take a punch, parts of her neck were still exposed. I could easily make out her face and identify her. Swords were easy to react to. Magic was similar in that regard. Her defensive amulets could detect all forms of energetic attacks and react to block them, even if she couldn't. And if she was able to sense it, then no matter what it was, it was useless. She would just activate her defenses personally, surrounding herself with an impenetrable bubble. My reticle rested on her neck as she moved, my coat subconsciously activating and dilating my perception of time. My spark fed information to me, ingrained human heuristic processes boosted with psyche and fed with information from my aura giving me incredibly accurate calculations for my shot. Everything was accounted for. My zero point, distance, wind speed, humidity, even margins of error. Not a single variable my aura could detect was left unaccounted for. I tracked her movement, concentrating intently, anticipating her direction and even the sway of her body. I was so focused, in fact, that I almost felt like I could feel her intentions, even at such a distance. It was like reading another's aura, but at a distance far greater than I had ever done before. She confusedly jerked her head around, eyes darting around, unknowing as to the exact nature of the brief contact our auras made. And she found me, our eyes locking right as I pulled the trigger. It sailed through the air, a supersonic shockwave following behind until it was replaced with thin wisps of blood. A gout of brilliant red erupted from her neck, almost obscuring the clean separation between her spine and head as she tumbled forward like a puppet with cut strings. I took a deep breath, calming my nerves as time rushed back to normal speed, a strain making itself known in my temple from my brief but extensive expenditure of psyche. One shot, one kill. It was so simple it almost felt like cheating. The bullet hadn't even been enhanced with Psyche. A regular bullet from a regular gun on my end, and a dead crime boss on the other. She was as ordinary as I was and literally didn't warrant more than that. In this world full of superhuman freaks, it really was hard to be a summoner. Warlocks could create impenetrable bubbles, and knights, by default, were built like literal tanks, not to mention the effects of vigor extension. Summoners were but fleshy punching bags before them. That was why I didn't feel like I was cheating. In exchange for this awesome power, I was horribly vulnerable. It wasn't long ago that I had been smacked across a room with no more than a half-hearted wave of a hand, suffering serious injuries in the process. There were two extremes, and unfortunately, I sat about as far on one end as one could get. I gave myself an opportunity for one more sigh then slunk off the roof I was on. By now, if my little legend hadn't already spread, it was about to make another set of rounds to remind people about my infamy and exactly what it meant. A single explosion meant that someone had died at my hand. There was nobody else who could mimic what I did. It was a signature at this point. As I climbed off the building, I could see people murmuring and looking around, looking for me in curiosity. One or two even seemed to recognize me. Their gazes on my body were rather intense, though not hostile. Thankfully, I was far enough from my target not to be found. Now I just needed to hide away for a while and let the chaos fester. In a day or two, nobody associated with Sarah Trot would give two hoots about taking revenge on me. They would be too busy scrabbling for the power she wielded. That alone would ensure my safety, at least in the short term. In the long term, the target on my back only got a little bigger. But I didn't care much. I would be leaving again soon for another school field trip. And even if I were here, so long as I was in the Magisterium or the hotel, I was safe. A bigger concern was the war going on with the Tavera family at the center. The Patriarch was basically one of my patrons. I wished I could do more to help him, but the war was out of my league. Anybody I could reasonably kill would have a negligible impact on the outcome, and I would be putting my life in grave danger for trivial gains. It wasn't worth it. 
especially not to me. I was indebted to a lot of people and wanted to help, but I wouldn't go and kill myself like that. Couldn't pay anybody back if I was dead. My life wasn't even worth enough to compensate for my debts. So I could only sit on the sidelines and watch. I scurried away with those thoughts, retreating to the hotel where I found the key master. I walked in with a smile. Hello, key master. How's the night treating you? Ah, John. Long time no see. The night is well, and its darkness is rid of one more slippery rat. Damn. It's like you were there with me. Hmm. He smirked ever so slightly, giving me a weird feeling. It's impressive how efficient you are with such matters, John. I was just listening for that familiar sound. Every time it rings, I can almost feel the gratitude of the entire market. Yet it is accompanied by the frightened and enraged screams of the damned. Your name is carried as far as your bullets soar, but fame and infamy walk hand in hand. Sometimes I worry for your life. Ah, oh, you worry about me? I appreciate the concern, my man. I do. I stuck out my fist for a bump, yet my man didn't know what it meant, so he lifted his half-clenched fist with a confused tilt of the head. I smiled and bumped his knuckles before leaning on the desk. If I ever need a safe harbor, I'll just come running over here. I have a feeling nobody would dare trespass on grounds such as these. Nobody but the Almighty. Then I have nothing to worry about. Hopefully I'll be able to get to a point where I won't need it. But until then, I can only thank you for your hospitality. Of course, John. But don't think you don't deserve at least some of the things you receive. Not even I can know how many lives you've saved by killing the person you just did. Just by removing evil you allow good to flourish. It's dirty work sometimes, but what you're doing makes you deserving of some good yourself. He let out a small laugh. I still remember what you said not long after we first met. You called yourself a leech back then. Do you still feel like one? Yes, I do. H.M., you certainly have a lot of pride. I would say it's a bad thing, but that drive to help people is saving a lot of lives. I've been told that before. My girlfriend seems to think the same thing. Perhaps it's a pattern worth recognizing. If I agreed with the foundation of the accusation, I would agree. Ha ha, how stubborn. I do enjoy these talks, John. As do I. I smiled as he stuck out his hand, shaking it. I can tell you're tired. To be sure to rest well. May we talk again soon. I will. Have a good night, Key Master. Always. With that goodbye, I retreated to my room for the night. It wasn't long until sunrise, but since I was still in vacation mode, I decided I could sleep in as much as I wanted. Chapter 97, Cosmic Scale A few days passed, but the turbulence in the market only grew by the hour. My name was making ripples in the market and Libidus even sent me a message that all my co-workers had been talking about it. My bounty even rose to 170,000 coin, a numerical reflection of my infamy. Thankfully, everyone in the market was distracted. With me hiding out in my room all the time, they didn't have the time or patience to try and kill me. That wasn't even accounting for the proven difficulty of taking my head. It was January and vacation ended on the 20th. Amara was doing her best but wouldn't be back for a while so I had nothing to do and a lot of time to do it. My primary focus was training. Over the course of a week, I devoted close to 30 hours to tracing paths through my ever-developing advancement formation. My motivation couldn't be higher, but Psyche was only half the equation now. Aura was now one of my most important tools, only below summoning, the base of it all. After my little spat with President Carrion, one of the pieces of information my spark had processed was the incredible compression my aura was under. It had tried to uncontrollably rampage with all its power back then, expending a massive amount of my energy in a very short period of time. I had basically been unconsciously trying to kill Carrion with it, but it had been confined to just beyond my body, despite the level of power exerted. Carrion's aura had been so incredibly dense owing to his authority that mine, relatively powerful, had been thoroughly suppressed. While it seemed wholly negative at first, I had actually come away with a few positive takeaways. The result was the experience itself. With just a bit of analysis, I could mimic that feeling and confine my aura to my body instead of letting it diffuse freely. It was quite uncomfortable at first, as it had been when Carrion did it. Back then, I felt like I had been blind. Perhaps my spotty vision and blank head had been, in part, caused by the suppression rather than my rampant emotions. And that blindness was crucial to concealing my aura. Contrary to the physical eye, blindness in my mystical I meant invisibility to the aura of others as well. Of course, that was a rather oversimplified way of putting it. Plex was testament to just how much more was beyond me, but, without a doubt, this new ability of mine was invaluable. 
The only other benefit that could come close in value was how refined my aura became, specifically in its form. Another aspect of my aura that had changed was its weight. Having been squeezed into a little box, it now spread significantly less even when I wasn't actively trying to hide it. It was sharper, more consolidated, denser. By default, it still took the form of a cloud or mist, but with a noticeable increase in power. I didn't know exactly how much. It had doubled at least, perhaps even more. Aura was less quantifiable than even Psyche, already incredibly vague on exact quantities. I didn't even know it could be made more powerful this way. Any power differentials I had experience with, I simply chalked up to the gap in authorities. I had only been honing my technique over what I had. It was like trying to increase a factory's productivity without even realizing entire portions of the production process could be cut out. Apocryon showed me what it meant to have control over aura. Carrion showed me what it meant to have a powerful aura. They were two sides of the same coin, and both were benefiting me greatly. In fact, this increased power of mine was the main reason why I could train for much longer. Aura was almost like the energy of my consciousness, but with a denser power, I was not only able to go for longer, but I was also able to exercise much finer control of my psyche. Psyche was about complexity, vigor about intensity, and mana about feeling. Those were vague descriptions, but there was no doubt that advancing oneself as a summoner required them to make massive jumps in the complexity of their power. And to make complex things, one needed precise control. Perhaps this was the main barrier to summoners that blocked many from advancing their power. At some point, the advancement formations would become so complex that their ability to control Psychus simply couldn't keep up. Practice could help, but Aura was definitely the leading factor in one's ability to get better. I was sure it was like that for knights and warlocks too. Perhaps to them, it was obvious. But summoners didn't have an obvious way to integrate their Aura and Psyche. It didn't help that they were considered useless. It was like a knight trying to get stronger without knowing that he could project vigor with a swipe of the finger. Summoners were still blindly searching through darkness for the right path. What cruel irony to see the smartest ones fumbling about to find their way. Well, at least Maxwell and I were doing things differently now. After Amara returned, we had around two weeks together with no interruptions or work. The first night when she came back was quite passionate. We hadn't been apart for so long since we started dating. We both had distractions and work so it wasn't all that bad, but when we finally reunited, we indulged in each other to more than make up for lost time. From then on, productivity naturally decreased. We still trained every day, as was standard routine. But generally, we spent our time either in each other's company at the hotel or going on dates to fun little places around the capital. However, we also spent quite a bit of time discussing things. The topic was almost always scientific. Amara wanted to learn everything she could from my knowledge. It helped with her understanding of the world, as was science's purpose. But we hadn't really gone deep into the nature of the universe and its most fundamental principles. These things weren't concepts that you could discuss once or twice. There were countless rules and principles based upon a fundamental foundation that Amara almost entirely lacked. She wasn't to blame, of course, but it meant that she had less of a quantifiable understanding of the world around her than even children did on Earth. And so I had to start with her from the very beginning, which involved me diving into some deep topics that could have exposed my otherworldly nature. The things I knew came from a very different place, and they were explained as such. I constantly had to reiterate to her that magic had no hand in anything I talked about. It was difficult for her to detach such an intrinsic part of her life from her understanding, and that was only to grasp some basic scientific concepts. I couldn't even fathom having to explain something like electrical engineering to her. Not that it made it unfun. She genuinely had endless curiosity, and I was eager to tell her everything I knew. It made our discussions interesting, and it was especially exciting for both of us when certain things clicked for her. Amara was definitely smart, and I was glad that she was able to adapt her mindset enough to soak the knowledge up. Those two things would no doubt aid her in the future as she realized her talent. Our two weeks together were spent like that. Nothing but fun dates, romance, and intellectual discussions. And so the last day of our vacation arrived. You say the air around us can become liquid? Yes. The atmosphere around us is composed of a bunch of different elements. And there are how many states of matter? Four. Solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. Right. And most elements can go between all those states, even if it's difficult to make them. With extreme temperatures, like extreme cold, you can even make air into a liquid. Why does a gas become a liquid? Because the energy of the atoms is reduced enough for it to condensate. Cool it below its melting point, 
and it will become a solid. Yes, that's all you need to really know, but there are some special cases. The melting and boiling points for elements are obviously different. It's why the air is naturally air while water is naturally water. The planet rests at a constant range of temperatures. If the whole world became significantly hotter, water would evaporate and most life would die. Similarly, if temperatures drop significantly, water would freeze and throw us into an ice age. But because air remains a gas at this temperature, we're allowed to exist. However, there are a few elements that are nearly impossible to turn into solids. What gases are those? Helium, for one. Hydrogen, too. Not sure about nitrogen, but oxygen can technically become a solid. Hmm. Amara looked down, reading through the periodic table of elements I had drawn up for her. That high school studying was starting to pay off. That paper was only one of many pages that I had left doodles on. I mainly drew things out for her so she could visualize what I was talking about. It was how many people learned, because sometimes worded descriptions weren't enough. She had a whole booklet of these pages by now. That was because, as it turns out, not only did Saika and Aura make you smarter, but it also made you something of an artist. The ability to draw the images in one's head didn't come easily to most, certainly not me. I was no artist, that's for sure. But after trying my hand at it, I found that I was far better than I had been previously. That was the main reason she had so many pages. I got excited and doodled every chance I could to exercise my new artistic skill. The only thing that reduced my image quality was control over my own hand, but with practice and enough time, that would be rectified. Amara sighed, leaning back and processing the knowledge I gave her. You're really turning my worldview upside down. Well, I suppose I understand that. Everything I'm telling you is normal for me. It's no different from how you see magic. You simply understand it without thinking. That's what science is for me. Right. You didn't have magic where you were from. No, I didn't. So when I encountered magic, my worldview was flipped, just like yours is now. Even then, what I'm teaching you is only the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more out there. I get chills just thinking about it, but you won't understand any of it unless I lay the groundwork for you. Like what? Give me a hint. Well, all right. Let's see. I compiled my thoughts before speaking. The sun in the sky. Yeah? You told me it's a big ball of fire really far away. It is. But that fire isn't actually fire. You see, when atoms get crushed together hard enough, they fuse into one being. That fusion releases a ton of energy, and you know how many atoms are in a small space. That many atoms all fusing together constantly in such a small space would release a huge amount of energy. Yeah, it would. All right. Well, imagine an entire world, like the one we're on. And imagine if it were all made up of atoms that were all fusing together constantly. It would be a ball of fire that releases an ungodly amount of energy. Yeah. And now, imagine a million worlds worth of atoms, all fusing together and releasing energy. Amara went silent, attempting to comprehend what I was telling her. Once she nodded slightly, I continued. That's the sun that you see in the sky. A massive ball capable of containing a million worlds, and one that does nothing but explode and release light and heat. That heat is what warms this world. It's the sole reason we exist. That's what a star is. And that's just one. Come here. I suddenly grabbed Amara's hand, pulling her to the huge wall of glass that gave us a beautiful view of the city. But I didn't care about the city. I pointed up at the sky. With no light pollution, one could see the stars in the night sky, so bright and clear. You see all those little dots of light? Those are stars and galaxies. And what we see is only a fraction of what exists. Imagine every inch of darkness in that sky containing billions, no, trillions of stars. Many of them are far more massive than the sun we see, thousands if not millions of times bigger. There are literally countless stars. And there are countless worlds, countless moons around those worlds just like our own. All of them are so far away that even given millions of years of flight, we could never reach it. The closest star is no less than trillions of miles away. It's a scale that humans literally cannot comprehend. I let out a breath, staring up at the sky, almost entirely forgetting about Amara and my small moment of existential enamor. But I had thought about these things no small amount of times before, so I was able to pull myself away and look down at my girlfriend. She was still staring, silently grasping the enormity of the universe. Even in numbers it was difficult to comprehend the cosmic perspective, but after two weeks of scientific discussion, she was beginning to understand, just enough to abstractly realize its scale. She was like that for almost a minute before she looked down, spaced out. It's difficult to understand. You kind of lost me with the big numbers, 
but I feel like I get just how enormous stars are. Hey, that's good enough. With more time, you'll start to understand more. I have a question, though. How did you, or your people, figure this stuff out? Like the stuff that happens inside of a star to produce the light? It's so far away, and nobody could ever step foot on it. How did they figure it out? She asked curiously, finally zoning in and looking at me. I rubbed my chin with a smile. Well, you see, it was one of the greatest minds to ever live who paved the way for truly understanding how a star works. Many people tried to propose different theories on how it worked. Some thought it was a massive ball of liquid-like lava that was just slowly releasing heat. But one man, named Albert Einstein, came out with perhaps the most important, or at least the most iconic, mathematical model to exist in science. I grabbed a sheet of paper and wrote out the mass-energy equivalents. E equals mc squared. Short and simple, but those five characters were monumental in the history of science. Energy equals mass multiplied by the speed of light squared. This laid the groundwork for understanding that the sun has so much material that its own gravity crushes the atoms in its core to the point of fusion. The very same force that pulls us to the ground when we jump also causes the sun's core to explode with nilimitless power. This forms a cycle known as the proton-proton chain, also called the PP chain. Hey, PP chain. She chuckled a bit, as did I after having intentionally dropped that pawn. I'm glad that you're as mature as I am. Anyway, you don't have to see something personally in order to find out how it works. It took a long time, but we advanced science so much that we could explain things that we couldn't even see. And we verify its truth with math, which is basically a language in and of itself. I see. She went silent again, taking a few seconds before muttering. I guess I really am the lucky one. I have you to give me knowledge that nobody else in the kingdom knows. Well, it helps you. So I'll continue to give you knowledge so long as you want it. I want nothing more than for you to grow your own strength. Since my knowledge does that, then I won't spare the effort to teach you. Thank you, John. Her response was more heartfelt than I expected, surprising me a little. Seriously. Not even my mother can understand the things you're doing for me. I don't know if you can either. What you're giving me is priceless. And I know you're not even doing it because of our relationship. Is that right? Well, you enlightened Shadowbane to Aura despite having come in contact with her for all of two hours. You do it because you're a good person, better than anyone else I know. So my thanks comes to you not as your girlfriend, but simply as Amara. I want you to know that my appreciation for you and what you're doing for me is completely unfiltered. Oh. I looked at her, taking a mental step back and reevaluating her. Not as my girlfriend, but simply as a person, as Amara Teleria. I turned and faced her, almost erasing my love for her and viewing her in a completely platonic manner. And I nodded. You're welcome. I'm glad this is able to assist you so much. Well, your demeanor just flipped on its head. Amara recoiled a bit, looking at me weirdly for a few seconds before leaning in and nudging me with her shoulder. All right, back to boyfriend-girlfriend mode. Roger, Roger. I smiled, my love for her crashing back through my mind in full force. We both instinctively leaned in and kissed, looking into each other's eyes before she mumbled. I love you. Thank you for everything you're giving me. I wish I could give you something just as valuable in return. Well, since you see it that way, I guess you're in my debt. I'll have to cash in on that in the future. Yeah? What do you want? How much should I prepare to give to you? She asked temptingly, causing me to grin as my hands snaked around her waist. I think I'll have to start with your hand. Okay. And then? Then your body. Hmm. I'm not sure if I should be excited or nervous. Anything else? And then, your life. I spoke while leaning down and kissing her neck. I'll need help raising the kids, after all. HH how many? I don't know. Stronger authorities make it more difficult. So I think we'll just have to keep going, and going, and going, until one of us gives first. I smiled while kissing her neck repeatedly, causing her to shiver. Hearing my last words, her deep red face tried its best to give me a confident smirk. I think I'll win that. Oh? Hey, honey please. I laughed a bit, giving her cheek a quick squeeze before we dove into another hug. Chapter 98. Warmth. You've seen the new rankings? Go to the Hall of Fame, new display. Authority 7 Cyclops. Cooper. A common. I think he heard us. Place straight into fourth year. Freaking cold summoner. Got suspended, the president. With the delirious. A bounty. Shit. They're everywhere. I instantly snapped to him when he walked out into the hallway, a hushed whisper permeating through the crowd. The Magisterium campus had come back to life after winter break, 
students bundled in thick clothes clustering in groups across the open campus. But only one thing seemed to be on their minds, John. He clicked his tongue and went on his way, arriving at a doorway where Amara was waiting. The two linked up, glancing around them. You sure are popular now. I know. If I kissed you now, it would really catch some attention. Now let's control ourselves, please. Her face flushed scarlet, not all from the cold, as she took his arm. It was a bit embarrassing to walk around with so many eyes on them. They were basically broadcasting their relationship. She normally didn't mind the attention on John much. No matter what she did, he would somehow attract more. She just preferred subtlety, especially right now. They were having enough issues as it was, and this definitely wouldn't help. Not that they could do much about it other than hide away in their rooms. But necessity called, and they needed to go to plenty of places. The first being the ranking steal. They made their way to the leaderboard, having yet to confirm John's new ranking. Killing an Authority 7 had been achieved before, but it had been so long ago nobody knew how many points it would bestow. The last time he checked his rank, he had been rank 11 with around 500 points to his name. That had increased with each trip, rising into the thousands. Now, he looked up near the top. Rank 1, Pontek Goliard, 3,060 points. Rank 2, Fiden Desmus, 2,800 points. Rank 3, John Cooper, 2,780 points. Rank 4, Betsmon Verga, 2,550 points. Rank 6, Amara Teleria, 2,420 points. Rank 12, Tana Churon, 1,660 points. The couple saw their new ranks and smiled. You've officially surpassed me. It was a special circumstance. It means little. John had a small smile, but when Amara saw it, she didn't sense any amount of happiness. That's when she suddenly remembered something, though it made her confused. By the way, about that crown you were going to make with the corpse. Did you decide against it? No, not really. Having the scout's observation would be a huge indirect buff. What's a buff? A benefit. Anyways, you know how important sight is for acquiring targets at a range. Yes, I do. So why are they saying the corpse is in the Hall of Fame? Well, let's go see it first. John mumbled with a low voice, Amara walking with him to the hall. It was a grand building spanning the entire west side of the Magisterium. It was quite literally a hall, walkable from end to end. The eternally preserved spoils of war from the Magisterium's founding to current day sprawled across its length. On the side of the hall most relevant to recent events, an entire building's worth of space was occupied by a large crystal prism. John. There was a shout as they walked near. John and Amara saw the rest of their squad, Vetsmon, Fiden, and Tana. They smiled and approached, giving greetings. It's good to see you guys. Have a good vacation? Of course. Did you? I enjoyed myself. We both did. I wrapped my arm around Amara's shoulder, squeezing her as she play fought back. All right, all right. Let me see this case. She moved away, everyone's eyes drawn to the glass case. A polished bronze plaque made itself known. John's name was pressed in bold black lettering on top with smaller letters detailing exactly what was done and when. Inside the case was a series of stands and wires that pieced together the mangled corpse of the Cyclops Scout. While much had been mulched by John's anger-fueled trench gun, enough of the body remained intact to make it seem whole. It was still as tall and lanky as when it was alive. As a rather bitter capstone, the intact head with its huge single eye glared at all passersby. That's Mont's side. I still can't believe you actually killed that thing. It gives me the creeps, even in how it looks now. Like I said to Amara, it was a unique circumstance. An Authority 7 is an Authority 7. You saw how many it killed. And it may have killed us too if not for you. John half-heartedly agreed in response, staring at the corpse with an intensely neutral face. Amara leaned over and tapped him softly. So? What about the crown? Well, the material for it is right there. He waved to the glass case, causing her to look at it again. The corpse, in its entirety, was locked in the glass case. Even the black crystal, which Amara could faintly sense, was solidly encased in the flesh of its head, untouched since initial mulching and transportation. The others had been listening and picked up what they were talking about, coming to a unanimous agreement that the scout crown would be incredibly useful. But one problem remained. John was on one side, the eye on another, and a wall of crystal between the two. Amara felt her heart sinking. Are you going to retrieve the corpse? I was. But Carrion told me, according to Magisterium and Kingdom Law, I had no rights to the corpse. So I will not be retrieving it. Fuck the loss. 
The curse practically leapt from her lips, an ineffectual expression of rage against rancid inequality. Are they seriously going to take this away from you? They would stoop that low. According to Carrion, it's a great way for him to get back at me for what happened at his mansion. No, that's not right. You made the kill, so you should have the right to do whatever you want with it. Not according to the loss. Carrion has every right to do what he did and pin the corpse up in here. Dink. John raised his knuckle and tapped the glass. Hmm. Seems strong. Whoosh. Some wind was kicked up right as he said that. He looked at Amara. She had rage painted all over her face. Even the mana around her couldn't help but react to her emotions. But she didn't explode. Not yet. She just looked at John, almost like he was the one she was mad at. When did you talk to Carrion? The day I got back. You didn't tell me for three weeks? You had your own business to deal with. And after that? I wanted us to enjoy our time. I had long accepted this by then. I didn't need to make you this mad during that time. Fuck. She stomped, a pressure wave exploding from her foot and kicking up the air in the surroundings. All eyes fell on them, silence reigning through the hall. But Amara didn't care. All she did was turn back to the case. Then, a large spell appeared before her, wind gathering before forming a long, dangerously sharp blade. The air was tangible as it was compressed, almost enough to condense it into a liquid. And then, it was launched forth. SCRE. A slicing scream was let out as the air blade and the glass collided. But even after that, there was only the slightest scuff mark left behind. John scoffed. He really pulled out all the stops. It can't even be stolen. That glass is probably worth more than the corpse inside it. He's mocking you. Yes, he is. John confirmed Amara's statement with a simple nod. He's mocking me with my own achievement. He knows how valuable it would be to me and so he hangs it over my head. And there's nothing anyone can do to change this. Yes, there is. I can do something. But you're not going to. He looked down at Amara, his expression neutral. But she could feel how dead serious he was. Just leave it, Amara. It's nothing more than a missed opportunity. There will be plenty more in the future, and now I've learned my lesson, so this won't happen again. We both know that's not the point. Yes, we do. But there's nothing I can do about it that won't just make things worse. So I'm going to swallow my pride and let him have this win. Can you do that with me, please? Amara was silent, the rage filling her mind, yet held back by the rationale in John's request. She wanted to be unreasonable and try to exercise her authority to fight against this. But disregarding how ineffective that would be, doing as John was doing was the smart choice, and she knew it. Her fist trembled as she held herself back, her voice trembling in response. Fine. Thank you, my love. He hugged her to his chest, looking over her head at the corpse in front of them. The others beside them had realized what was happening, even if it took a minute for it to settle in. Fiden suddenly frowned and took out a spear filling it with vigor and stabbing forward, all of it concentrated on a single point. Ting. It met the glass and stopped, nothing but the tiniest pinprick left behind on the glass. His hands trembled in response, all the pressure from the strike reverberating right back through his palms. Sorry. I can't break it. It's fine. Let's just go. John turned and started walking with Amara, leaving the hall. The others followed behind him, while many watched from the sides. They needed to be at training soon anyway. After walking for a while, we arrived at the training grounds where we found all the other elites in the Puppet Master. I made eye contact with him, the two of us nodding to each other before we got started. Today's scenario is a collective one. You all will be responsible for defending a small base. The wave of beasts will be constant and will last for two hours. In order to successfully defend yourselves, you will need to give everything you've got and work together. This means knights will need to form defensive lines and warlocks will need to coordinate spells. I will not tell you how to do any of that, so good luck figuring it out yourselves. He waved with that last word, teleportation magic enveloping us before sending us to the center of a military base. There were almost 40 elites now, and all of us arrived in a massive group. Once we hit solid ground, there was a shout. All warlocks, get up the walls. Knights, follow me. It was Pontac Goliard, and he immediately took charge. Nobody could argue with him, not to mention how stupid doing so would be when time was of the essence. Monsters were already besieging the walls. I rushed up the stairs with the warlocks. This would be a good chance for Amara and I to let off some steam. The knights below us formed a defensive line in front of the gates. They knew their own rotations best, and we could hear their shouts as they organized themselves into groups. The warlocks were similar, dividing themselves into sections along the wall where they took turns firing off spells. Normally this would all be good for a war of attrition, 
Many hours of defense required not just constant killing, but also enough rest. But it was clear that we wouldn't be getting much rest. The monsters we saw were big and plentiful. It would take everything we had in order to defend for two hours. That much was certain. Taking out a chair, I equipped my new modified rifle and started shooting. I knew my own pace, so I ignored everything else and simply did what I was good at. Time skip magic. All right, good job. You're done for the day. In two days we leave for the blooded hold, so finish your preparations and recover. Dismissed. The puppet master waved us all off, though half the elites were sprawled on the floor in exhaustion. Even I was taking a knee, my breathing heavy and my head splitting with an ache. My eyes were focused downward on the snow beneath my feet, each one of my breaths letting out a long fog from the cold. It was only several minutes later when everyone started to rise and disperse. Vetsmon grumbled, several minor injuries across his body, his armor radiating some steam from the heat of his skin. That guy is trying to kill us. We're getting better though. Fiden mumbled after him, causing me to nod in agreement. It was hard work, but every time I drained my psyche and stressed myself, I would have long dreams that assisted in my cultivation. Over a month had passed, putting us at the end of February. Tomorrow was the first day of March, and we would be leaving for the blooded hold the next day. For around 40 days, the puppet master pushed all the elites to our limits. That was especially so for our group, who we seemed to have high expectations for. Tana couldn't even walk since she was so tired, having bounded around the battlefield for three hours without rest. Amara was sprawled on the floor too, her mind in another universe after having her mana drained so thoroughly. I was hardly better than them but that was because I was improving just as fast, if not faster than them. Over 40 days, I had made strides in my progress. The original estimate for completion of my Authority 5 formation was 7 months, of which 2 had already passed, but I was starting to think that I was a bit ahead of schedule. I was now done with my first layer of the 3-layer formation. It happened so fast that I was starting to think dreaming was too strong of an ability. Then again, the others were improving at record speeds as well. Fiden was even faster than before, Vetsmon was around 20% stronger, and Tana had much more stamina. As for Amara, she had the greatest progress. I was helping her study science every night, and she was coming to a deep understanding of it all. She could already use some rudimentary fire magic despite not even properly creating whatever core she needed to gain her affinity. She understood it far better than I did, and all I knew was that my teaching was bringing her forward significantly. She was already in Authority 5, so she was on her way to becoming an Authority 6. Once she did that, she would gain a perfect affinity for that level and start using proper fire magic. The others were Authority 5 as well, making their way to Authority 6. I was pretty sure that Fiden was the furthest along, being close to the cusp. I was the only one still stuck at Authority 4, so I needed to catch up, which I seemed to be on my way to doing. After finally getting up, I bid goodbye to my squad, Amara and I walking off together. We were all tired, and tomorrow we were planning to have a dinner together, plus Fiden's girlfriend. Since that was the case, we decided to just retire right after training. Amara and I didn't stay at the Magisterium much anymore. The hotel was far nicer, so we always ended up staying there. After taking a carriage and greeting the key master at the desk, we took the elevator to my room. There, I entered my room and stripped my clothes. Amara was letting me have the shower first since I sweat from all the running. She could use magic, so her physical exertion was a level lower than mine. Once my sweating garments came off, I opened the walk-in closet and took a look. A quarter of the closet was filled with my few sets of clothing, while the rest had gradually been taken by Amara. Dresses, stacks of casual wear, plus all her delicates organized neatly in a drawer. I smirked a bit. We were living together. I didn't have any problem with it. Amara's family had a property within the capital, but since she had the dorm, she was never expected to use that place. And now that I was here, and we liked the hotel room a lot more, she phased herself in. We hadn't talked about it properly, but there really wasn't a need to. It happened naturally, and we were okay with it. There was nothing more to say about the matter. I washed myself up before letting her have the bath. She enjoyed stewing in a hot tub while I liked succinct and generally cool or cold showers. Plus, sitting in a hot bath was basically just marinating in your own filth. I didn't get it, but she liked it and came out smelling nice, so I didn't care much other than when I occasionally poked fun at her. I took my place on the couch, laying there before passing out for a bit, as I usually did. Unlike vigor or mana, draining psyche directly made one tired. I could barely even think straight after such a strenuous day, 
so I at least needed a nap if I wanted to be functional for the rest of the evening. It was an hour later when I woke up, the alarm of my aerial spurring my consciousness, and the scent of some cooking ingredients tickling my nose. I sighed and got up, walking over to the kitchen where Amara was chopping some ingredients. I'm just getting it prepared. That's fine. I smiled and wrapped her in a hug from behind, watching her cut. Having been raised as the daughter of a duchess, touching any kitchenware other than gold-plated dining utensils was out of the question. Ordinary society here was like olden society back on earth. Women were taught how to cook. Such a thing was normal for most of the population, nobles being the exception. Amara had never learned an ounce of cooking, while I had learned enough to cook some tasty meals back on earth. After some observation, she asked to learn some from me and after a day or so of teaching her, we established some ground rules. The main one was that, until she at least learned how to use a knife properly, she didn't get to cook at all. I had to teach her how to prepare ingredients, so any time we cooked, that was what she usually did, and she was a fast learner. Before long, she was able to do most of the work while I needed to do the more important parts that required some experience, like the actual cooking part. She tended to overcook out of fear that something would still be raw, and for the sake of time and ingredients, she just let me take over that part, especially when we were tired. I watched her knife work, dicing what was basically blue garlic. Some vegetables were far different in this world, and garlic was apparently one of those. It still took the form of cloves, but it was blue instead of white making me apprehensive at first about using it. Once she was done dicing that, she moved on to slicing some chicken before preparing some spices, doing anything within arm's reach so as to not interrupt our hug. But once she was finished with everything, she set her knife down and relaxed back into my embrace. The two of us silently stood there, tired and aching, finding some comfort and ease in the warmth of our bodies. The night was cold, sprinkles of snow falling outside the window, cooling the room. I'm tired, Amara mumbled. I could tell she just wanted to go to sleep, but we needed our fuel to recover. That was one thing I learned from sports. You can't skip the refueling process, even if it was a chore. I pat her waist. I know. Go wait at the table. I'll finish up. Thank you. She let out a breath as I gave her a quick kiss. Once she separated, I grabbed the ingredients and finished making dinner. After plating everything and sitting down, our eating was spent in silence. On normal days, we would have some kind of discussion usually when she asked some questions about a scientific topic she didn't understand. Ever since my lecture about the stars, she had been constantly asking more about it. But tonight, we found our enjoyment in silent communication, sitting right next to each other, the only sound being our forks tapping against our plates. And when that was done, we both went straight to the cold bed, piling two large blankets over our bodies and cuddling together. I could make the room whatever temperature I wanted, but leaving it cold, oddly enough, made it more comfortable when you found warmth in another person. Chapter 99. Debt. After another day passed, Amara and I had one last proper dinner with our squad before getting ready to leave for the blooded hold. The dinner was cheery and was essentially a triple date. Fiden and his girlfriend were getting along well. They weren't quite as open with their relationship as Amara and I were, but that was normal. I was far bolder than typical, one of the reasons Amara was always so embarrassed. As for Vetsman and Tana, well, they hadn't gotten far, but progress there was definitely progress. I could only applaud Vetsmon for his efforts. He and Tana were a lot more chummy, definitely much closer than they had been a month or so ago. But Tana was still oblivious. I was worried about Vetsmon getting too deep in the friend zone, but there was only so much I could do to interfere. Making him panic and then Russia could ruin everything before it even started. I didn't want either of us to overthink, so I left the guy to work his magic. He was at least trying which meant, sooner or later, the make-or-break moment would arrive. I just had to sit back and wait and offer what little help I could. The Magisterium's fourth-year class was set to leave for their next expedition. There was no grand departure ceremony this time. The underclassmen who idolized the elites and the students' families came to the platform for a final send-off, but the platform felt more like a typical train departure. As we boarded the rail with our luggage, I suddenly thought of something while looking out to the families. The puppet master had said that none of his elites had ever died under his care. That was an amazing track record to have. His training obviously worked well, but that didn't apply to those in the fourth year who weren't elites. There had been a few deaths in the normal student body. Still, it wasn't impossible. Murphy's Law would screw over anyone not up to standards and ensure those who did would meet something beyond. It must be scary for all these parents to send their children to the front lines. 
They weren't even soldiers yet, and they were already risking their lives. That was the unfortunate reality of this world. War on Earth seemed a lot better in comparison to this. Modern battles had a lot less collateral damage, casualties in general were heavily reduced, and the fighting was dictated by the people at the top. Parents could direct their rage at actual people in charge and had a chance to at least revolt and try to effect some change. But in this world, the scourge was an existential threat. The common people who fed the war machine couldn't even revolt. The very people who fought off the strongest of the scourge were also the ones who ruled with an iron fist. The ordinary man could only swallow their discontent. Only by the grace of those at the top who still held a sense of justice were the ordinary able to live relatively good lives. It was just another difference between this world and the one I called home. I turned and boarded the rail when Amara tugged my sleeve. It was a three-day trip to the base. We would be making a stop midway as well in a city. It was one with a name I actually recognized. We're here. All students, gather. An instructor called us onto the platform. This is the city of Halesburg. You all have three hours to wander and do as you wish before we continue our journey. Don't cause trouble and don't be late to return. This rail works on the military schedule and it won't wait for a stray student aboard. Unless you want to be stranded here, keep an eye on the clock. That's all. Dismissed. With that, the students dispersed through the terminal to enter the city proper. My squad and I followed, laying eyes on the modest city. There were a lot of farms around here so this place acted as a transportation hub. This terminal was especially important for transporting food to other cities like the capital. What should we do? Betzmann asked while looking around. The city was smaller and not as rich, so options were limited. There really wasn't much around. I looked around and nodded my head toward a main road. Let's wander. If we see something we like, then we'll go from there. All right. The rest of my squad nodded, all of us taking a walk. It was good to loosen up the muscles anyway. Fiden's girlfriend joined us along the way, so the six of us went around the small city and took in some of the sights. We stuck out like a sore thumb. Gazes fell on us and flicked away just as quickly. Our rich kid from the city looked painfully obvious to the small-time merchants and farmers out in the streets. Anybody we came across was quick to get out of our way. I felt like I was being treated like a mob boss. There were a few shops that caught our eye, so we just went where we felt like and bought some things, some jewelry stores, clothing shops, armories, smithies, tea shops, the works. We checked out anything interesting. Nothing really caught my eye, but my main focus was elsewhere. We wandered through the quiet market for another two hours. And just as my hope started to wane, we came across a small side plaza, vendors neatly lined up against the squat mud brick buildings. And there, standing behind a counter talking to another man, was my old friend. My eyes brightened. Chief. Hmm. The old guy turned around, his eyes widening in panic as his gaze fell on my coat, but immediately narrowing when he saw my face. John. Yeah. It's been a while. I it has. I didn't expect to see you here. He seemed a bit baffled as I went up and shook his hand, patting his shoulder with a broad smile. I happened to be passing by. How are you? How's the village? We're doing just fine, as always. What about you? Things seem to be going well in the capital. Well, I got into the magisterium. And it's been tough, but I'd say things are working out quite well. I'm an authority for now. Oh my. Congratulations, John. I'm very glad you were able to make your way. He looked shocked at my news, his eyes bulging a bit as he forced out a smile. I could see him glancing at my squad behind me. They were rather confused, and the chief was quite overwhelmed. So I decided it was right time to make introductions. Chief, these are my friends from the Magisterium. We're in a squad together. Guys, this is the chief from Umer Village. He helped me get to the capital when I was stranded and had absolutely nothing to my name. I owe quite a lot to him. Th there's no need to exaggerate so much. It's a, a pleasure to meet you all. The chief stammered out a greeting, shakily bowing before exchanging handshakes with everyone in turn. He seemed a bit more comfortable after that, almost as if he had confirmed that the squad and I were real. John, you said this is your squad? Are you all going to the front lines? Yes we are. I was placed in the fourth year, and I managed to get into the elites after that. The elites? You all. He looked around at everyone with quite the reaction. I wasn't sure if he was just surprised or scared. That's when Amara spoke with a small smile. John here managed to fight his way up to elite rank three. He's the best summoner to ever walk through the magisterium. Summoner. He also managed to kill an authority seven scourge beast. He's in the hall of fame now. S7. 
With every sentence spoken, the chief's terrified surprise became more evident. I elbowed Amara who seemed to enjoy exasperating the problem. All right, no need to butter me up so much. Hoo-hoo, all right. Still, I'd like to make a proper introduction. Hello again, chief. Amara smiled and curtsied toward the chief. My name is Amara Teleria, daughter of Duchess Teleria, rank six of the elites, and John's girlfriend. Pleasure to meet one of my boyfriend's patrons. Why, yes. The chief wasn't sure how to react to all that sudden information, bowing a bit with a blank yet panicking expression. I clicked my tongue at Amara's antics. But then, I saw Vetsmon step up with a goofy grin. I'll also introduce myself again. I'm Vetsmon Verga, son of Ignatius Verga, the family head of the fourth paladin peerage of the church. Also the rank for elite. I'm Fiden Desmus, son of Marquis Adrian Desmus, rank 2 elite. I'm Tana Choron, daughter of Count Phelan Choron, rank 12 elite. I'm not actually a part of their squad, but I'm Mira, daughter of Marquis Revenon, rank 11 elite. The chief and I were silent as everyone introduced themselves. The little plaza had gone silent. I felt dozens of stares on me and my friends, a scattered mix of fear and awe. The sons and daughters of some very powerful people were here. I suppose the chief hadn't expected such an intense greeting, because he was now completely flabbergasted. If not for him trying to show these noble children a respectful smile, he'd probably look horrified. Why, yes. It's a pleasure to meet you all. He forced the words out, his face almost red with strain. I clicked my tongue, shooting the others a look before patting his shoulder. Don't worry about these posers, chief. Come on, let's go get a drink. Who's a poser? I want a drink too. Me too. Don't let Tana have a drink. Everyone quipped as they followed the chief and I, heading to a bar where we ordered some alcohol. I sat on the edge of the table with the chief, a bit of separation between us and the others. Once he got some breathing room, he patted down his sweat with a long breath. Goodness, John. You've made some powerful friends. It hasn't even been a year. A lot has happened. Nonsense. You're dating the daughter of a duchess. Are you secretly a noble? I'm not. I chuckled and took a sip, the chief stealing glances. I found the difference between an ordinary village chief and us magi rather amazing. I was ordinary just like him not even a year ago, but now I had risen to live a life likely unfathomable to him. I came from his perspective, so I could understand both sides. I guess that's why I was feeling quite close to him. I could relate to him in a way the others couldn't. Even then, I couldn't imagine what he must be feeling, being in front of so many high nobles like this. Back when I had first met him and showed him my crest, he had bowed in respect, and that was merely because I was a magus. Now, he was in front of these people who sat even above magi, wielding both incredible power and kingdom-wide influence. He had been raised in this world. Such an encounter completely contrary to common sense was beyond anything he could ever dream of. Well, it would be one hell of a story to tell, that's for sure. After a bit more conversation with the man, I asked him a question. Chief, do you have a spatial sack? Oh, of course not. Those are quite the legendary items. Even my entire village couldn't save enough money to buy one. Well, I promised I'd pay you back. I want you to take this as my thanks for your help back then. A proper thanks, too. Not the measly thousand coin I had given to you. Amara. I turned, catching my girlfriend's attention and tapping into my telepathic connection with her. We had made it a habit to simply keep it active. Can you create a barrier around the two of us? If you can block sight and sound, that would be nice. All right. I'm just going to give him some money. It's for his safety, just in case. Oh, sure. She nodded and cast some magic, covering me and the chief in a dome of condensed vapor. Nobody could see or hear anything from without, so I took out the item I had prepared in case I was actually able to find him. Here, chief. This is a spatial sack. It can hold about a chest worth of items. I made sure it was subtle and could be used by ordinary people. W what? His eyes bulged when he saw the band I placed on the table in front of him. It was a Polaris brand spatial sack card from a special kind of wood, powered by an embedded white crystal. There was no indication of any magic though. It looked like a completely ordinary wooden band, like something an ordinary carpenter would carve for fun. Because the chief was completely ordinary, utilizing its storage features was the limit of what he could do. He didn't have a crest that it could bind to, so it would be up to him to keep it safe. So long as he did so, it would remain a very valuable item. But that wasn't even the good part. Inside that band is 80,000 coin. Alongside what the band itself cost, it's a bit over a tenth of my savings. I felt that was a good amount to give you. 80 what? 
I am sorry, John. I couldn't possibly take so much money from you. Chief, you went out of your way to help me when I had nothing. I don't care that you only spent a few coin to get me into the capital. You were the one who brought me there and opened the door to all the other opportunities one got. You secured my future. Without you, things would look quite bleak for me. Now, I want to secure your future. I grabbed his hand, slipping the band over it and onto his forearm. It shrunk to his size before activating. His eyes went blank for a second, likely seeing everything inside. He couldn't stop the magic even if he wanted to. He was soon aware that there was in fact 80,000 coin inside, broken up primarily into silver denominations. It wasn't like I could give him 80 gold bullion and expect him to actually use that. That meant the band was loaded with a pile of silver coin. Only 10 of those coins were gold bullion. After seeing more money than his entire village made in years, he tried to take the band off. John, I can't dash. All right, stop. I think I said this last time, but I'm not taking no for an answer. It's about time I paid you back, so take the band and use it wisely. It should be enough for you to live comfortably or to get yourself to that point. Besides, I'm going to be making more money as I increase my power. Don't stress yourself out and accept this. He went silent as I stared him down, seriousness in my eyes. It was almost like I was threatening him to accept it, but this was what he deserved. I didn't believe in simply paying back what I owed. I believed in paying back that debt proportionally. What he had given me back then wasn't even something that could be repaid in money, but it would have to do for now. I lifted my aerial, seeing the time and realizing we had to leave soon. I stood. All right. Our rail leave shortly. That money and band is yours to do with however you wish. The only thing I can ask is that you're smart with its use. This dome around us is meant to prevent anyone from knowing you have this kind of money. But once you step out of here, it'll be up to you to keep it safe and hidden. I don't know when I'll be able to see you again. So until then, I wish you and your village good health. Right as I said that, the dome dispersed. I stepped out of my seat, joining the others donning coats and bags. The chief stopped me right as I was about to leave. John, hmm, may the Lord bless you. I know you're fighting the scourge. Please, keep yourself safe. The world is a better place with a good man like you in it. I wish upon you happiness wherever you go. Thank you, chief. I went and shook the man's hand one last time before leaving with my squad. As we walked back to the rail, Betsman elbowed me. Did you give him a fortune or something? No. It was just a gift for his help. Knowing you, it was probably a hundred thousand coin. I also saw the spatial sack. Amara chimed in, shooting me a glare. You can give away all the money you like yet can't accept something like a stupid loot without being forced to. I'm indebted to him, not the Raven family chief. That's besides the point and you know it. I can't believe that I actually wish for you to be more selfish sometimes. Why should I be selfish? For your own sake, stupid. Ack. I jumped a bit as she kicked my leg, a small smile on my face. The others made similar comments as we walked back to the terminal. The platform bustled with activity, students about everywhere in final preparation for our resumed journey to the front lines. I sighed, rather content after handing off my gift. It was the first time I was able to properly pay back a debt. Chapter 100, Royal. Even from a distance underground, we could hear the sounds of battle. Our supervisor, a lieutenant, called out and shook us from our stupor. We braked hard into the station, the terminal already filled with wounded for loading. Disembark and move to munitions. They'll have instructions for you there. Hurry up. We've got casualties that need loading. Flashes of red and white briefly silhouetted defenders scrambling atop tall stone walls. Explosions rang free from all sides, an occasional scourge beast being flung high into the sky. The blooded hold was far larger than any base we'd ever been to before. I couldn't even make out distinct people on the other wall. It was just a mass of colored uniforms launching fireballs and arrows. I already had my coat on, so I slipped my gloves over my hands after picking up a prepared pack from supply with the others. Protocol was pretty standard. The warlocks were to go up the walls with ranged knights while the remainder were to meet up in the courtyard to coordinate a counter-assault. As per usual, summoners were left to do whatever. When we exited the terminal, I was able to pick up several powerful auras within the base. One of them matched President Carrion and Authority Eleven. There were a few Authority Tens below him and many more Authority Nines. As for the Authority Eights and Sevens, they were everywhere. There were as many as there were tents in the hold. Those at our level still outnumbered the others by far. There were thousands upon thousands of soldiers here. The base itself covered dozens of acres, and it was the main wall in front that held the beasts back. 
The terminal was in the middle of the base not far from headquarters. However, the sheer size of the base made the distance rather great. That's why several trucks were waiting. All those from the Magisterium, board the trucks and we'll take you to the wall. Hurry up. We were waved on, my squad sticking together as we piled into one of the transport trucks. It wasn't long before we were dumped out to fight. I went up the wall with Amara, running down its length until we found some room in one of the sections. We didn't ask questions. We just set up and fell into the cadence of the commanding officer nearby. Fire. A hundred mages launched their spells, the darkness flaring with fire, plumes of steam briefly flashing into existence before wind cut them apart, scourge beasts falling to pieces or vaporizing under the devastating assault. The tide briefly opened, the ground visible for moments between the collapsed bodies of scourge beasts before being swallowed up again by another fresh wave of hostiles. Any warlock at the level to fight here had more than one affinity. There was no earth magic being used since the knights were forming offensive lines to meet the scourge at their best. Any agitation with the ground, while effective at disrupting scourge lines, would prove equally effective at tripping up the advancing knights. My gun, for once, barely stuck out with the sheer amount of screaming beasts and fiery explosions. That I was using my suppressed Springfield definitely helped in that regard. The moon was bright enough to see a decent distance by, so I stuck to picking off larger targets, whittling down HVTs while the warlocks cleared out riffraff with area of effect spells. I tapped into my telepathic connection with Amara for a sudden question. Hey, it takes a warlock three advancements to develop a perfect affinity. Can they develop two different affinities back to back? Or do they need to completely advance their affinity before moving on to another? Give me a moment. A gust of wind, uniquely tinted with Amara's aura, slice through a group of advancing beasts. Okay. They can technically take whatever path they want. They can advance their water affinity twice before suddenly switching to fire for a couple of advancements. But no matter what, after an advancement, a decision is made that dictates the purpose of the next level. I see. I nodded while firing another shot. It seemed warlocks didn't need to focus entirely on one affinity at a time. But then that inspired another question. Why is it normal to focus on one at a time? Because then there's more time for an enlightenment. Not only that, but since the chances of becoming an authority 12 are so low, if you wait to develop the entire affinity for too long, you may never be able to complete it because the difficulty gets too high. Then you won't have any good affinities, just a bunch of average ones. It's no different from setting yourself up for failure on multiple levels. That makes sense. If you were like Amara and completed your air affinity early, you would have potentially decades to work on being enlightened. But if you refused to take the last step in favor of developing other affinities, all that time would be wasted. By the time you finally took the last step, the chances of you ever being enlightened in your life would be slim. It was better to simply develop each affinity one at a time. That way, even if you never made it to Authority 12 and gained all four affinities, you would be a master in the ones you had. It was rather simple logic. The only downside was that you wouldn't have the spell versatility the other affinities gave you for periods of time. Even that wasn't really a negative. The strength of perfected affinity gave you far outstripped the versatility of more. Quality over quantity, as some would say. I mulled over these thoughts as I chambered another round, a four-legged beast crumpling off in the distance. I was perched on a chair, as was Amara. She'd learned her lesson and brought one too, so we could preserve our stamina during long battles like this one. After some time, though, I felt something poking at me from beyond the darkness of the battlefield. I dragged my reticle across the back of the horde but even the moon didn't provide enough light for me to see that far away. I didn't feel anything concrete even after reaching out further with my aura, but I knew for a fact. There was something, someone, out there. We're being watched. What? By who? Amara lifted her head. I could tell that she was concerned about the people around us, thinking that some nobles were trying to cause trouble. I shook my head. Nobody on the wall. Something is out there beyond the battlefield. I can't see them but there are definitely a pair of eyes on us. That doesn't sound good. Another scout? It doesn't feel like one. It's not hostile, just curious. I don't know why one would be so close either. I brought the scope back up, looking around to see if I could make anything out in the distance. But it was futile. The feeling was too faint and visibility too low. However, at some point, the feeling rapidly grew. No, it was getting closer. My eyes widened. We were a half day too early. It seems they made a stop. A humanoid spoke from atop a hill, another one already there turning to face it. The two of them could see the waves of monsters besieging the wall, watching indifferently as the humans fought them off. The other humanoid waved. 
It doesn't matter. There's plenty of fodder left, and they're here now. Who is it that you said to keep an eye on? A few, but two in particular. The former approached the latter, a crystal orb filled with mist condensing into two profiles. One was labeled Pontek Gulliard, the strongest elite of the Magisterium. There were some descriptors labeling his outstanding achievements and abilities, as well as his noble title. But there was another one beside it. John, the son of Gulliard is powerful, but not beyond expectations considering his noble lineage. The great outlier in recent times is this John Cooper. So far, we've collected little to no information on him. No noble title, no family, no background. The only achievement he holds is being the rank 3 elite, and that wouldn't be anything of note if not for the fact that he is a cold summoner. Hmm. The second figure took a look at the information below John's portrait. His keen aura and abnormally powerful weapons were of particular interest, but no additional details could be provided, not even on their functionality. Nonetheless, he was an outlier, one that it took interest in. Where is this John now? He's on the wall. It seems his summons are ranged weapons. We're collecting information on him as we speak, but the conclusion right now is that he's someone to keep an eye on. He's said to have a keen aura. We can settle this now. A bow flashed into existence in the figure's hands, a hefty arrow being knocked as he scanned the walls. At some point, he recognized an oddity. A man sitting behind the wall, wielding a weapon that occasionally let out explosions. They weren't of any sort he'd ever seen before. Through the distance and ambient noise, it couldn't be heard well. But it was noticeable enough. He smiled. Found him. He raised the bow, pulling the string back before locking in place, a momentary tableaus of brutal grace. A slight twitch was all it took to perfect his aim. He watched as John stopped firing, eyes tracking each suspicious movement of his head. There was a lull in John's movement. Fingers twitched. The arrow flew true. His eyes followed. John's eyes widened. How interesting. He smiled. A blur of gunmetal gray flew past my head, a gust of wind brushing past moments later. My eyes followed a second later, fast, but not fast enough. It had implanted itself solidly in the wall behind me, the arrowhead's only proof being a cross-shaped hole surrounding a metal shaft. To travel such a distance and still impart enough force to burrow itself into a reinforced wall required an incredibly powerful night behind it. Amara also froze, staring at the arrow with cold sweat forming on her forehead. T that's. This portion of the wall had fallen silent surrounding soldiers sensing the wisps of leftover vigor flowing from the point of impact. The commanding officer realized the section had stopped firing and turned to chastise them when he too noticed the rod impaled in the wall. What is that? An arrow. Something out there fired it. I mumbled in response as he walked over and yanked it out, a shower of debris accompanying it. Amara spat out her words. That's a royal. Why the fuck did a royal try to kill you? I don't think he was trying to kill me. I responded to her telepathically. There was no hostility. Merely observation, until I sensed the arrow. It feels more like a test than an assassination attempt. That's even worse. Let's get off the wall. She stood and stowed her items, grabbing my hand and leading me down the wall. We need to find the puppet master and tell him about this. Does this mean something? You do know what royals are, right? Amara asked as we searched around, causing me to nod. Yes. They're intelligent humanoids unlike the rest of the Scourge. Then it should be obvious that catching the interest of a royal is really bad news. I don't think you know this part, but the intelligent part of the Scourge doesn't just sit back and throw fodder at us all the time. They use the scouts to collect information, then take out targets with potential. There's been many reports of student deaths from royals. So they want to kill me before I can get stronger. Well, they certainly know about your strength now. It's safe to say that everything you do beyond the walls of this base from now on is going to be extremely dangerous. A strong scout is the least of our worries. I could feel Amara's solemnity through our connection. It seemed that the Scourge had its own special task force in charge of espionage and sabotage. This was a side of them that the public didn't know about or conveniently chose to ignore. If I was now on a list, I had to be extra careful. If they really wanted to kill me, then there wasn't much I could do to protect myself. After a bit more thought, I stopped Amara from walking before taking out my aerial, dialing the puppet master. Yes, John. I have some bad news. I told him about what happened, causing him to go silent for a moment. I swear, you can't go a day without pissing someone off. I didn't realize I needed to tiptoe around the Scourge's feelings. I'm talking about me. Here I am trying to keep you alive while you continue to attract the worst possible enemies to have. 
Now I need to second guess every little mission I send you on lest everyone gets killed just because you were with them. You know, I'm starting to think I should just kick you off the elites so that you don't get put on every damn hit list known to mankind. My face went blank as the puppet master ran it through the aerial as if it were my fault. Well, I couldn't completely blame him. I let him get everything off his chest, a process that took a whopping 15 minutes. He was usually succinct, but apparently today he decided to take exception to my plights and talk my ear off. It was quite impressive, really. Once he was finally done, he took a few deep breaths before giving me some clear instructions. Just sit your ass down on the sidelines while I figure this out. And don't go blabbing about this either if you want to keep your life. Yes, sir, puppet master, sir. Don't patronize me. He grumbled and hung up, causing me to chuckle. So? Omara asked, earning a shrug. The puppet master just rewarded us with unpaid vacation. We get to do whatever the hell we want until he finds a suitable mission for us. Which may take a while. So he's keeping you away from danger. Good. How strong are the royals anyway? I hadn't a clue how strong they were besides judging bounties and looking at information available on the Black Spider repository. Anything on there would be worth killing and thus higher authority, but I didn't have exact numbers. Bounties were so high on royals both because of the lack of information about them and their high kill counts. What I did know was that they were humanoid scourge entities with intelligence on par with humans. That made them especially dangerous because they could plan ahead just as well as humans could and, more importantly, control the masses of beasts below them. There weren't as many of them as there were humans, so humanity still stayed ahead. But on the battlefield, numbers meant less, so their lethality was amplified. Even more worrying was their odd powers. While some were generally in line with the three magi classification, others diverged and were more like scourge beasts. I wouldn't know what to expect when facing one until they attacked. Amara shrugged. They still go by the same authority system as us. They can be of any level, but chances are, the one that tried to shoot you was an absurdly high level since you're not dead. Still, they're not things you want to mess with. I get that. Let's just relax. Lord knows when we're going back out. I prefer to train until then. I grabbed Amara's hand and walked off. The battle was still ongoing, but we had done enough. Some relaxation and food would be just rewards. Chapter 101. Easy. Maxwell was expecting me to be in authority five and five months, the end of the school year. The three-layer advancement formation was difficult to even start. Like any puzzle, I had to look for patterns, accumulate information, before realizing how things fit together. But once I finished preparations, it was just a matter of time before the first layer was completed. The second layer essentially restarted the process with a whole new set of patterns and the added difficulty of needing to couple and anchor the formations to the first layer. It would be more difficult, but the experience gained from constructing the first layer made me pretty good at recognizing patterns. I was pretty confident in the speed of my progress. After analyzing over the break, I was making good progress with the second layer. Some pieces I had connected and laid aside, others I had attached to the first layer as foundations. In the process, I realized I could still utilize the first part of the advancement formation to help me with cultivation. The advancement to the fifth authority was all about preparing my mind to accept a second spark. I needed to make my mind stronger and faster to properly fit the second spark. It was like upgrading a computer. My hardware had to get better to accommodate another component. Advancement formations were sets of instructions for how to move magical energies. Some steps were obscured until the entire formation was complete, but they still existed. Most couldn't take them early. They were obscured, after all. But since I was a damn genius, I was able to make them out and take some of the steps early. This acted as a sort of positive feedback loop. My initial efforts kick-started the ocean of stars in my mind. They now moved along a current that, despite being slow, was significantly beneficial. And each speed up in my thought process from that moving current meant I could comprehend the next steps faster, which would thereby result in even faster thinking. After rinsing and repeating that cycle a few times, my progress exponentially accelerated. So I utilized my newfound free time, courtesy of the puppet master, to buckle down and train. The siege petered out by the next day, and the puppet master hadn't yet received missions to send my squad out on yet. We were all just stuck indoors while everyone else got sent out. I used that time to train almost relentlessly. Or, in all honesty, it was more like studying than anything. You know, you're pretty relaxed about all of this. Amara sidled up to me on my buck. Getting targeted by royals was no different from being targeted by the entire scourge. It wasn't something to take lightly, as the puppet master's rant had made quite clear. 
It's because I've got to focus on my advancement, but I'm well aware of just how large the target on my back is getting. In fact, it's getting quite suffocating. There are enemies I need to face that are at a level I can't handle, and my ability to hide is rapidly decreasing. I needed time to grow, and there were just so many things that cut into that time. The balancing act was delicate. I couldn't seem to do anything that wouldn't end with a blade in my face. I could only redouble my efforts in the time I had. My aura was sensitive to danger, but it also reinforced my own sense of urgency. Every gaze that landed on me, every hostile thought, every threat, was yet another level of stress that stuck with me throughout the entire day. My aura reminded me relentlessly that I needed to get better. It amplified my subconscious worries and incessantly reminded me of my inadequacies. Refusing to train was nearly impossible now. My subconscious screamed at me, my mind wouldn't let me, reality dictated against my wishes. My only source of comfort in these trials was Amara, and even then I couldn't tell her everything. Her normalcy was my rock. After that day, the puppet master didn't send us on any missions. We sat within the base and trained for two entire weeks. After a while, I felt like he was being paranoid with how safe he was trying to keep us. But at some point, he finally came to us with a mission. We were called to the briefing room and arrived early, eager to see what he had in store for us. You're here. Good. Are you sharp? The puppet master asked me as I took a seat at a table with my squad. Yeah. It's been nothing but training these last two weeks. At least you're not lazy. I guess that's the only reason you're not dead. Anyway, I've got a special task for you and your squad. He lifted his hand and papped the board he was standing beside. On it was a map, as well as a few images of some scouts. From some patrols and scouting operations, we've received reports on scout activity along this ridge. I have a feeling it has to do with you and the interest the royals have taken. They've been trying to find both you and Pontek but it doesn't seem like they're planning anything big. They aren't willing to invest too much to kill you yet. Headquarters wants to use your specialty to run a counter-operation against them. You're good at killing scouts, and that's what you're going to do. You'll be working with a squad of soldiers. There are three of them, and they're going to take you out there and bring you back. One of them is an authority eight knight, so you'll be protected if anything goes sideways. The other two are warlocks, authority SIXS, there to provide some extra firepower if you need it. Still, if all goes as planned, you'll be the only one killing anything. Are there any royals over there? Plus, these scouts are quite literally designed to pick things out. How am I supposed to kill them without fighting everything nearby? We haven't seen the royals recently, though it isn't guaranteed that they will be absent, so that's why you have the authority eight. As for how you go about keeping yourself hidden, that's entirely up to you. Killing even just one scout is still considered a mission success, so do what you need to do to stay alive. You'll get more of these missions depending on how well you perform. So do as much as you can, but don't be foolhardy. You'll get plenty of other chances, so just do what you're good at and make this worth it. Hmm, all right. I nodded at him. He was giving me autonomy, which spoke to how much he trusted my abilities. Well, it seemed I had earned that trust among several people. I seemed to be getting sent on these kinds of missions more and more. First to Vera, then the Key Master, now the Puppet Master and the military. Well. I couldn't be surprised. I happened to be pretty good at what I did. You leave in an hour from the western gate. The target location isn't very far away. Backup will be on standby. Any questions? It was a pretty straightforward mission, but I still had one concern. The soldiers. Will they defer to my decisions? Yes. But they're ranked higher, so don't expect them to bend over backwards. I've already discussed all of this with them, and the commander agreed to trust me and let you be the centerpiece of this operation. If it fails, don't expect to get called up for it again. It won't. So long as the situation is reasonable. I'll trust you'll make it so. I've heard what you've done over in the markets. You seem to have a knack for this. Anything else? Heads shook around the room. Good. Go forth and prove me right. With my concern rectified, the briefing ended, and we were dismissed to prepare for the mission. I wasn't surprised the puppet master had heard of my exploits in the market. It meant that my name was getting out there, or at least my infamy. Big names, like my targets, going down the way they did, would no doubt cause a ruckus. I didn't feel much pride in the task itself considering it was almost too easy for me, but that didn't mean others could see that. I made a note to myself to prepare for more of these missions in the future. The others were just there for support, but we all still had to prepare for a worst-case scenario. To do anything less would be stupid. We trickled our way to the western gate over the next hour each of us grabbing whatever specialty-specific gear we needed from acquisitions. 
I was the first to arrive, needing nothing other than my summons and some rations. Waiting for me was a group of three soldiers in two trucks. The authority aide approached me. I'm Chief Commander Carlson. Just call me Chief Carlson. You're John. I am. I look forward to working with you guys. Likewise. We shook hands, my impression of this man rapidly growing positive. He was an officer, but wasn't immediately an asshole, even to a cadet. From my experience in this world, people tended that way when facing anyone of lesser stature. We'll be in charge of transportation and protection. We've been ordered to leave any offensive combat to you. A simple in and out is what they said. If all goes well, it'll be just that. They might not even know we were ever there. Well, that makes me curious. Let's go. You all will be with me. The warlocks will take the backup Hummer. With his word, we boarded the Hummers. We were gone within minutes. By now, evening was arriving. The sun would set not long from now. Dusk would give me enough light to see by, but also some darkness for concealment. From the western gate, we rolled across the relatively flat terrain around the base. The dead scourge that once covered the immediate area had been vaporized, buried, or removed by the numerous garrison warlocks. A few hills here and there were the only other outstanding features. There weren't even forests. After about half an hour, trees started encroaching on clear landscapes. We eventually entered a forested ridge, forced to slow down to better navigate it. Thankfully, we didn't have to go in deep. Just ten minutes of driving through the ridge was enough to put us on top of a ledge overlooking the land below. We're approaching the target area. We'll disembark here. John, tell us where we need to go to best support you. We'll do. I nodded leaving the Hummer and stepping out onto the rocky ledge. I walked to the edge of an outcrop, squatted down, and summoned my modified Springfield. Through my scope, I could clearly see what looked to be a small camp. There was a small river flowing through the area, and the Scourge Beasts had set up a rudimentary camp around it. There were some winged beasts, likely their transportation, and several scouts. From a cursory count, I could see six. It was possible that more were out there, just not home yet. And around the scouts were some escorts, at least 40 of them. This shouldn't be too bad. There are six of them. Best case scenario, I kill between three and five from the shadows before bailing. Worst case, I kill one or two before bailing. You can guarantee at least one kill? Certainly. That's the easy part. The challenge will be killing more before exposing my position. Hmm. That's the least of our worries. There are scourge beasts not far from here. The issue with launching these attacks is the possibility of getting surrounded before withdrawing. At that point, I myself might even be overwhelmed, to say nothing of your squad. But we were told that you can kill them from a distance. I can, though not this far. Let's see. I lifted my head, scanning the surrounding area before pointing at a closer cliff. Bring me there. Very well. I'll separate us into two groups. The others will hang by the other Hummer, and I will accompany you to the outcrop. I was told you have a partner. Yes. Amara will join us. The rest of you, mind waiting for us? No problem. Vetsmon answered from the side. Chief Carlson nodded. Then let's move out. No reason for us to be still out past Chow. With those words, we all jumped on the Hummers. Amara and I joined the chief in his, while everyone else was in the other. When we drove, they hung back a couple hundred meters from the outcropping, while we pulled up right behind it. That was another benefit of these magic vehicles. They were completely silent aside from the tires rolling on the dirt. That made these stealth missions a lot easier. We jumped out and approached the outcropping. I laid down and crawled toward the edge of the rocky ledge. Springfield in hand, I scoped in. I reckoned they were about 350 meters from our position. The scouts were gathered in a group, chewing on the carcasses of some wildlife. I smiled. Most of them were stationary. That made this a lot easier. In a low tone, serious face on, I motioned to Carlson and explained the plan. The most I can kill in sequence is five, and that's if all my shots are perfect. I'm not betting on more than three realistically. After the first shot, they'll be alerted, so however many I get in five shots is probably going to be my limit. Understood. If they find us, though, we need to pull out quickly. They'll give chase as soon as they spot us, and after that, we'll have all the scourge beasts within five miles homing in on our location. I'll be prepared to bail. Just let me get off my five shots. Sure. He nodded, and with that, I nudged Amara who lay right beside me. Ready? All I need is silence. Of course. Keep in mind though, my bullets will still make sound when they reach the scouts. All this barrier is doing is keeping them from listening for our direction, to some extent. Remind me to ask you about how that works again later. Sure. 
Amara's sound barrier materialized around us. I felt like I had gone deaf. Every sound from outside was completely gone. I couldn't even hear my own breathing. I took some deep breaths, steadying my aim as I found my first victim. There were six, and in my head I planned my sequence of attack. Target priority in mind. I twitched my reticle onto the first head. I could only feel the trigger click, the recoil hitting only moments after, the suppressor and Amara's air working in tandem to completely nullify any report. Downrange, one scout dropped dead, its head sporting a brand new hole. The others were still reacting as I found the next target looking curiously at the corpse of its buddy. Although still careful, I took less time to squeeze off the next round, hitting center mass and dropping it to the ground. A quick look told me the scout was heavily wounded, not dead, but would soon be. A silent scream tore through the air, the other scouts finally getting past the shock to move. I ignored it, taking aim at the slowest just as it started moving. The beasts all around started scrambling moments later. .30-06 bullets were supersonic and thus broke the sound barrier, creating a shockwave that exploded in the ears of anything it passed. They had to pass the creature first before the shockwave was felt, but nonetheless, all of them were seeing their buddies drop to the floor before hearing an explosion. It was obvious that they were under attack, but they didn't know where the attacks were coming from. Some of them were already looking our way, probably inferring the direction from the way their buddies had fallen. It was impressively sharp for what was bound to be an instinctual reaction, but they still weren't sure where exactly they were being shot from. They couldn't see anything, for one, and vision was what scouts relied on. They could gather all the information they wanted, but their eyes took precedence above all, and thus far they could find nothing. That uncertainty was exactly what I needed. Having started striding off in multiple directions, the scouts made themselves too difficult to assuredly hit, so I held off for a little while. However, they couldn't keep running, and one stopped and turned to communicate. I fired at it, my body having steadied completely, my reticle resting right on top of its neck. I watched as the bullet tore through its chest like the last. All the beasts around it turned, watching in morbid astonishment as its body crumpled in on itself. Three bullets, two more to go. The other three scouts were now looking in our direction, doing everything they could to find us. I could sense their gazes through my aura. They weren't locked onto us yet but even the slightest movements would give our position away. I ignored it and found another still scout, firing. Shit. I cursed in my mind as the bullet landed off center. Instead of shooting through its chest, I tore off its arm at the shoulder instead. That scout fell to the floor, and its erratic movements made it too difficult to shoot accurately. So I instantly racked the bolt before settling in for my last shot. That missed shot caused me to panic a bit so I got a nice spike of adrenaline that helped me hyper-fixate on my next target. One of the two remaining scouts looked back at their screaming friend. The other one, however, was looking at me. I could feel its gaze. That shot had given me away. But that was all right. It was focused on me, our auras meeting. It was enraged and was already sending beasts to me. Several of the escort beasts started running in our direction. But its focus was its downfall. I could almost feel our eyes meet through my scope in an eerie sort of connection. That's when I realized that my intent could be easily read. It was also when I figured out how to utilize the aura technique I had theorized about. Instead of making myself invisible, I could just create the illusion of me being invisible. That also applied to my intent. If I focused on nothing but killing the scout, it would realize that and try to evade. It would be able to sense what I wanted to do. It was almost like mind reading. But if I masked the intent coming from my mind, then it wouldn't be able to read anything. And that's exactly what I did. I created a veil around my mind, dividing it from the rest of my aura that the scout could see. It was as simple as making a barrier of power. I could practically see the confusion on the scout's face as it seemed to lose me. A final trigger pull was muffled in the bubble. The scout's head fell as my bullet severed its neck. That was four kills and one casualty. I spoke to Amara through my telepathy. That's it. Release the barrier. Got it. She responded. Sounds of the world returning to my ears. I spoke. That's all. Let's get out of here. Ha, huh, with pleasure. The chief commander seemed oddly happy as we backed out and boarded the Hummer. Like that, we drove away, the rest of our squad falling in as we went. Before long, we had left the ridge and no scourge beasts were in sight. In and out, not undetected, but without contest. The commander laughed. You know, I've never seen anything quite like that before. No wonder he wanted you to do this mission. That was damn near the easiest mission I've ever done. Just like that, for scouts are dead, and not a single man was killed in the process. 
Nothing more than a bit of magic power for vehicles and your energy was spent. Well, it certainly went well. I missed one, but they just kept standing still. They were almost asking to be shot. How you did that from so far away is beyond me. Only the best archers I know of can pull off stunts like that. Which means that you, John, have earned yourself some more missions. Hooray for me. I gave a sarcastic cheer, making him chuckle. Don't be so down. These are the best ones to have. They're fun, relatively safe, and don't come very often. It may be another week before you get called again. So until then, you're living the life. That's true. Not only that, but your name is going to get passed around. Some might say otherwise, but I'm a firm believer in recognition being a most valuable resource. You're still in the magisterium, but if you want a good post once you enter the military, then you'll need to have some connections. Make yourself desirable, and you'll get desirable positions. I'll keep that in mind. Thanks. Of course. You're quite amazing, and not just for a summoner. Would hate for that talent to go to waste. I smiled. It seemed my initial assessment was right. After that, I lounged back with Amara as we drove back to base. He was right. This was rather fun. 